Chain Fire by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 216. Nietzsche smiled as she nodded her assurance. We both care a great deal about him. I assume that what you're telling me is only because you are concerned for him. That's right. She rubbed her arms again as she went on. When he came to... to pull me back or whatever it is he did, it was like he was inside me. Inside my head, I mean. It was a kind of intimacy unlike any other. Lord Raal healed me once before when I was seriously hurt, but this was different. Parts were the same, some of the feelings were the same, the sincere caring and such that I felt from him. But this was different somehow, really different. That time he was healing my physical injury. Kara leaned closer in an effort to try to get her point across. This time it was more. This time the touch of that evil thing was inside me, like it was poisoning me, poisoning my existence, my will to live. She straightened then, seemingly frustrated and unable to think of how to explain it better. I know the difference you're trying to define, Nietzsche offered. This time it was a more personal connection between the two of you. Karin nodded, as if relieved that Nietzsche seemed to understand. Yes, that's right. It was more personal. A lot more personal, she added under her breath. It was like my soul was laid bare to him. It was kind of like... Well, never mind. Kara went silent. Nietzsche wondered if the woman had said all she had really wanted to say and would decide to stop there, but then she went on. The point is that he felt so much of me, of my inner thoughts and all. No one has ever... Kara again went silent, but this time in apparent frustration at trying to find the words to explain what she meant. I understand, Kara, Nietzsche assured her. I really do. I've healed people, so I know the sensations you experienced, if not as deeply. I've never been able to succeed to the extent that Richard did with you, but I've experienced more or less the same conditions when I healed people, especially when I healed Richard. That's good to hear that you know what I'm talking about. Kara casually kicked a rock as she walked along. Will... I don't think Lord Raal is aware of it, but when we were together like that, he didn't just experience me, experience my inner feelings and thoughts, so to speak. I experienced him as well, she growled to herself. I shouldn't be saying this, she waved a hand. Forget I said anything. Nietzsche wasn't sure what the woman was getting at. Kara... If you aren't comfortable telling me, then don't. You know how much I care for Richard, but still, if you don't think you shouldn't say anything, or that you are stepping out of bounds in your relationship with him, then perhaps you should trust that instinct. Kara sighed. Maybe you're right. Nietzsche couldn't ever recall Kara appearing so flustered. If there was one thing enduring about the woman, it was her resolute confidence. She was always decisive about precisely what she should do in any given circumstance. Nietzsche didn't always think that Kara was right, and she knew that Richard didn't either, but they could always count on Kara being determined to do the best thing for Richard no matter how it might endanger Kara herself or anger them. If she felt her actions were necessary to protect him, she simply went ahead, dismissing the consequences to herself, including his disapproval. As they walked in silence through the dark alleyway, Nietzsche, with the help of her gift, could hear people in the distance speaking in low voices. She didn't try to pick out the words. She did no more than note the general nature of the conversation. It was men and women gathered at the stables, some speaking in turn. Nietzsche could distinguish Richard speaking gently to them, answering questions. She could hear people weeping. At the corner of the inn where the road to the right led down a few doors to the stables, Kara abruptly caught Nietzsche's arm and brought her to a halt while they were still in the deep shadows. Look, you and I, well, we both started out in all this determined to kill Lord Raal. Somewhat taken aback, 
Nietzsche didn't think that this was the time to split hairs. I guess you're right. Maybe more than anyone else, you and I have a unique perspective on Lord Rao. I think that when you start out wanting to do someone harm, and they make you see how wrong you've been and how your own life means much more than that, well, it kind of makes you care all that much more for them. I think I would have to agree with you. Kara gestured back the way they had come, toward the grounds of the palace that was now Liberty Square. Back there, when the revolt started, when Lord Rall was wounded and near death, people didn't want to let you try to heal him. They were afraid that you would instead do him harm. I'm the one who told them to trust you. I understood the awakening you had gone through because I had gone through much the same thing. I was the only one who knew what you had come to feel about him. I told them to let you do it. They feared you might use the opportunity to take his life. I knew you wouldn't. I knew you would save him. You're right, Kara. We both care deeply for him. We both have a special bond with him. Yes, that's it, a special bond. Different, I think, than other people. Mystified by what Kara could be getting at, Nietzsche spread her hands. So you wish to tell me something? Kara looked down at her boots as she nodded. When Lord Rall and I shared that togetherness, I felt some of his inner emotions. Inside him, he has a terrible, burning loneliness. I think that maybe all the business about this woman, this Kaelin, is because of his lonesomeness. Nietzsche took a deep breath and let it out slowly as she wondered at the precise nature of what Kara had sensed in him. I suppose that may be a part of it. Kara cleared her throat. Nietzsche, when you hold a man in your arms like that, and you have been, well, together in such a personal way, you come to truly feel what's inside him. Nietzsche pushed her feelings farther back into the shadows. I don't doubt that you're right, Kara. I mean, I just wanted to hold him forever, to comfort him to keep him from feeling so alone. Nietzsche stole a sidelong glance at the moored Sith. She was twisting her mouth as she studiously watched the ground. Nietzsche didn't say anything, waiting instead for Kara to go on. But I just don't think I'm the one to do such a thing for Lord Rall. Nietzsche cautiously framed her question. You mean, you don't think that you're the woman who can satisfy his loneliness? I guess not. Benjamin? The woman shrugged. That's part of it. She looked up and met Nietzsche's gaze. I love Lord Rao. I'd give my life for him. And I have to admit that lying there and having him in my arms like that made me feel... feel like maybe I could be more than just his bodyguard and friend. As I lay there in that bed holding him close to me, I imagined what it would be like to be his... Her voice trailed off. Nietzsche swallowed. I see. But I just don't think that I'm the one. I don't know why. I'm not exactly an expert in matters of the heart. But I don't feel like I'm the one he needs. I just don't think I could be. If he were to ask it of me, I would do it in a heartbeat. But not because I wanted it exactly. Do you understand what I mean? You mean you would do it out of your deep respect and caring for him, not out of your personal wish to be his lover? That's it, Kara said with a sigh of relief, apparently at having someone else say it aloud. Besides, I just don't think that Lord Rall feels that way about me. When I was sensing his feelings, when we were in each other's arms, I think I would have known if he felt that way about me, but he doesn't. He loves me, I know that much, but not in that way. Nietzsche carefully eased out her own breath. So, that's what you wanted me to know? That you think his loneliness is the source of his fantasy woman? Kara nodded. Yes, but one more thing, too. Nietzsche glanced down the street, watching men making their way to the stable. And what would that be? I think that maybe you could be the one... Nietzsche's heart came up in her throat as she turned to see Kara staring right at her. 
What? I think you could be the one for Lord Rao. She held up her hands to forestall any argument. Don't say anything. I don't want you to be saying that I'm crazy. Don't say anything for now. Just think about it. We'll be leaving shortly, and it will be a while until you can come to meet up with us. So you have time, and you could think about it. I'm not asking you to sacrifice yourself for him or anything foolish like that. I'm just saying that I think Lord Rall needs someone, and you could be that woman. I mean, if you felt right about it. I'm not the one he needs. I'm Mord Sith, and Lord Rall is a wizard. Dear spirits, I hate magic, and he is magic. We just aren't right for each other in all kinds of little ways. But you have so much in common with him. You're a sorceress. Who could understand him better than you? Who could help him with every aspect of his life better than you? I remember back that night at camp in the shelter when the two of you were talking about the creative dimension of magic. I didn't understand half of it, but it struck me then how the two of you could talk so easily to each other and understand each other's thoughts, ideas, and meaning like no one else could. I remember being taken by how the two of you, well, seemed so right together. And I remember thinking, too, when we lay down close to him to keep warm, how good you looked close to him like that. Like a woman would be close to a man she cared about. I remember for some reason half expecting him to kiss you. It would have seemed natural. Nietzsche couldn't make her heart slow down. Kara, I... Words failed her. Kara picked at a strip of peeling paint on the corner board of the building. Besides, you're about the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Lord Rall should have a wife who is his match, and I can't think of a better match than you. Wife? Don't you see how much sense it makes? It would fill the emptiness I felt inside him. It would bring him joy and happiness to replace his misery. He could have someone to share his gift and his connection to magic. He wouldn't be lonely. Just think about it. But Kara, Richard doesn't love me. Kara appraised her for a long, uncomfortable moment. Nietzsche recalled then Richard once telling her how paralyzing it felt to be under the scrutiny of a moored Sith when she looked into your eyes, really looked into them. Nietzsche now understood what he meant. Maybe he doesn't feel that way now, but maybe when you come back to join us, you could do a little more to let him know you were open to such a notion about the two of you. I mean, if you wanted to, if you were open to the idea. Sometimes people just have to be made aware of something so that they will consider it seriously. That's why I felt I needed to say something to you. Maybe if he thought you might be open to such a thing, then he'd get interested and start looking at you in that light. You know, people who are in love had to fall in love at some point. They weren't born in love with their mate. Maybe you'll just have to help him get to that point where he will start to think about you in that light. It could even be he thinks that a beautiful, intelligent woman like you could never care for him seriously. Sometimes men are shy that way about a woman they think is extraordinarily beautiful. Kara, I just don't think he... Kara leaned in confidentially. It could even be that he thinks you would never be interested in him, and so he dreamed up this other woman to fill the void. Nietzsche wet her lips. I think we had better get over to the stable, or he may leave without you. He seems pretty set on leaving. Kara offered a smile. You're right. Look, Nietzsche, if you'd rather, you could just forget I said anything. I can see that I'm making you uncomfortable. I don't exactly feel right about saying anything anyway. Then why did you? Kara gazed off wistfully. I guess because as I was holding him and I felt the depth of his loneliness, it just broke my heart. Her gaze drifted back to Nietzsche's. And more Sith don't get broken hearts all that often. Nietzsche almost said that neither did sorceresses. Chapter 22 Lanterns hanging from stout posts lent a cozy glow to the stable. 
The dusty smell of fresh straw hung thick in the wide passageway running in front of the stalls and pens. Men and women, some with their children along, had filled the walkway and in a few places spilled over into the empty pens. But now, after Richard had talked to the relatives of the men who had been killed, many had bid him a safe journey and started for their homes. Dawn was still a couple of hours off. Despite the hour, there had been a number of people other than grieving relatives who had come to ask questions about the impending battle for their city. More people, sitting on hay bales, had watched from the loft, but now many had started down the ladders. Richard supposed that they would be going back to bed to catch a little more sleep. He knew that their sleep would be troubled by worries about the soldiers marching toward their city. Victor, standing nearby, looked grim after speaking about the bravery of his men and how much he would miss each of them. Many people wept openly as they'd listened. Richard had known that nothing he could have said would have lifted their grief. He had done his best to make them understand what good men he thought they had been and how much he cared for them. In the end, all he could really do was sympathize with their loss. He had felt helpless and useless even though they had seemed to appreciate the things he'd said. From the corner of his eye, Richard caught sight of Nietzsche and Kara as they came in the big doorway at the end of the stable. They had to ease their way among people who were leaving. He had been wondering where the two of them had gone to, but surrounded by people all wanting to speak with him, he hadn't had a chance to go check. He'd figured that either they had wanted to let him have the time to talk to people, or else Kara had wanted to look around outside to make sure that all was well. Either way, he was glad to see their faces. So that's what you think then, that this thing, this beast that crashed through the walls of Ishak's inn was after you? An older man named Hendon asked as he paused beside Richard. He held a pipe with a long curved stem in one hand, his elbow propped on a rail as he spoke. The skin on his thin, leathery face sagged with the weight of years. Because he was older and possessed a quiet, prudent manner, many in the crowd had deferred to his earlier questioning of Richard. Hendon drew air in through his pipe and released aromatic clouds of smoke from the opposite side of his mouth as he waited for Richard's answer. Like I said, the evidence seems to point to it, so I think it probably was. But whatever it was, it's likely that it was coming after me. So you can see why I think it's best if I leave now and not risk that thing coming after me again in the city and maybe causing harm to a lot of people here. The man removed the pipe from his mouth and gestured toward Richard with the stem. You mean like those men with Victor were harmed as a result of you being near? Victor stepped forward. Now look here, Hendon, it's not Lord Rawls' fault that evil people are trying to kill him. Those same evil people want to come here and kill us as well, beast or no beast. Would you be to blame if your gang soldiers coming to kill you happened to harm Lord Rawl on their way to get you? My men were fighting against the Imperial Order when they were cut down by something evil. That evil was spawned by the Order. They were fighting for a world for themselves and their families in which they could live their lives free and safe. They made the choice to do that rather than live in subjugation. Hendon chewed on the pipe stem a moment as his placid eyes considered Victor. Just asking. Only think it's reasonable to know what the situation is and what we're up against. Richard saw heads among the men and women nodding. You're right. It is reasonable he told the man before Victor could get any hotter. I don't begrudge a man asking questions, especially where lives are concerned. But Victor is right as well. Jagang is intent on killing us all, and as I've told you, the order needs to be stopped or none of us, no matter where we are, will ever be able to rest easy. Richard saw Nietzsche slipping effortlessly through the press of people departing. Her flowing blonde hair cascaded over the shoulders of a black dress. The dress, cut low with a laced bodice, showed off her shapely form to advantage, but it was her commanding presence that made her stand out like a queen in the throng. Kara, in her red leather, could have been the royal escort. Richard felt a little uncomfortable at the way they both stared at him, as if they hadn't seen him for a month. 
Hendon unexpectedly clapped Richard on the back of his shoulder, bringing him out of his thoughts. The man spoke with the pipe clenched in his teeth. Safe journey, Lord Rawl. Thank you for everything you've done for us. We look forward to your return to the free city of Altorang. Thanks, Richard said with a smile to the man. Hendon moved in with the flow of the others who were engaged in conversation as they made their way along the aisle and out the door. Richard had been relieved to see that these people understood what their freedom meant and meant to keep it. Ishak, standing near Richard, waved his red hat at Nietzsche and Kara when he spotted them. There you are, he called out. Are you all right, Mistress Kara? Richard told me you were safe, but I'm thankful to see it so with my own eyes. Richard followed Ishak as he rushed to meet the two women, beaming his pleasure at seeing them both. We're fine, Kara said. I'm sorry about the damage to your inn. Ishak waved a hand as if the matter were trivial. It is nothing. Boards and plaster, nothing at all. People can't so easily be fixed. You're right about that. Kara said as she met Richard's gaze. Richard saw Jamila, standing on the other side of the passageway, scowl at Ishak's dismissal of the importance of the damage to the inn, but she didn't say anything. She held the hand of a little girl as she leaned back against the wall near the big door, watching. By the girl's round face, Richard thought that it had to be Jamila's daughter. The girl beamed an infectious smile at him, and he couldn't help smiling back. Ishak, I said that you should deduct the damage from what you owe me, and I meant it. Ishak replaced his hat. Why you worry so? I told you I fix. Before Richard could answer, he heard a commotion just outside. Some of the men who had been patrolling the neighborhood came in the door dragging two big men with them. The two men, one with tangled, grimy strands of dark hair, and the second with his hair cropped short, were both dressed in brown tunics, similar to those worn by many of the people of the city. Victor leaned closer to Richard and spoke under his breath. Spies. Richard didn't doubt it. He could see broad belts underneath the tunics that would probably have held weapons. With the Imperial Order soldiers getting close, they would have sent scouts ahead to gauge what they were going to be up against. Now that they were captives, it was possible that they might be prevailed upon to provide valuable information on the nature of the impending attack. Despite their attempt to dress the part, the two looked out of place among the people of the city. The plain clothes they wore weren't quite large enough to fit their bulk. Neither was huge, nor were they massively muscular, but they had a well-honed, cool, resourceful demeanor. Both men kept silent but their eyes were always on the move, surveying everything around them. They looked as dangerous as wolves among sheep. As the guards pulled the two men into the passageway inside the stable, Richard instinctively lifted his sword a few inches, making sure that it was clear in its scabbard before letting it drop back. As one of the guards turned to look at something, the prisoner with the long hair suddenly and savagely kicked the shin of the man holding him from behind. The guard cried out in pain and shock as he crumpled to the ground. The man violently broke the grip of the men holding his arms by twisting and flinging them away. Some of the nearby people were toppled to the ground. Guards pounced on the free man. In the scramble, several crashed to the ground, bloodied, and another tumbled back over a rail. In an instant, the subdued mood in the stable changed as the entire place erupted in panic. Women screamed. Children, when their mothers screamed, shrieked. Older children started wailing. Men yelled. The guards cried out orders. Confusion and fear swept through the crowd. The free enemy spy, a powerful man who knew how to handle adversaries and how to create a break for himself in a relatively confined space where they couldn't employ the numbers necessary to apply overwhelming force, sprang up with a roar. He had Jamila's little girl by the hair. Somehow in the scramble, the man had managed to snatch a knife from someone and now had it pressed to the girl's throat. The child squealed in terror. Jamila dove for the girl only to be sidekicked in the head. The powerful blow knocked her aside. 
Another guard on the ground at the other side also received a wicked kick to his head as he tried to use the opportunity to get close. Richard was already methodically advancing, his attention focused on the threat. Everyone back, the man growled at all the people close in all around him. He tossed his head to flip his greasy hair back off his face. His eyes darted around at the people trying to back up out of the way. He still panted from the effort of the brief struggle. Sweat ran down his pockmarked face. Everyone get back or I'll slit her throat. The girl, a meaty fist holding her aloft by the hair, again shrieked in terror. He held her fast against his stomach. Her feet kicked in the air as she struggled in vain to escape. Let him go, the man ordered the guards holding his partner. Now, or she dies. Richard was already lost in a rage unleashed. There would be no compromise, no negotiations, no quarter given. He stood sideways in a slight crouch, his right side to the man holding the girl, preventing him from seeing his sword. The man kept glancing at the guards to his left who were holding the other man. He wasn't paying any particular attention to Richard. The burly man holding the wailing girl didn't know it, but in Richard's mind, the deed had already been completed. In Richard's mind, the man was already dead. The fury of the magic from Richard's sword had been freed before his hand even found the hilt. When it did, the storm thundered unrestrained up through him, powering his muscles, joining his overwhelming lust to consummate the deadly thought. In an instant, calm had been swept away by a terrible avalanche of need for action. In that instant, there was nothing Richard wanted more than the man's blood. Nothing less would stop him. Conviction burned away all uncertainty. The sword of truth was a tool of the seeker's intent, and that intent was now simple and clear. Now that Richard's hand was on the hilt of his sword, nothing else existed but his purpose, and his singular purpose was to bring death raining down on the man before him. His vision tunneled toward his target. His entire life narrowed down to that singular lethal commitment. The man with the knife had only to pull it across the tender veil of flesh and the girl would die. But that would take time. Brief time to be sure, but time nonetheless, because he would first have to decide to do it. At that moment, the man's life was tied to the life of the girl. If she died, his shield would lose its value. He would have to weigh that choice and decide on killing her before he resolved to it. That decision would take a fleeting glimmer of time. Richard had already made his decision and had fully charged himself to the task. He now had a sliver of time that gave him an opportunity to alter the nature of the situation, to be the one to control the outcome. He would not let that small slip of time escape him. But even that no longer mattered to him. Now, powered by lethal rage, both the swords and his own, he wanted the man's blood. Nothing else would satisfy him. Nothing else would stop him. He would accept nothing less. Richard twisted away from the threat, putting the back of his shoulders to the man with the girl, feigning that he was turning away, that he was backing off as the man had commanded. In so doing, Richard knew that, with so many things pulling for his attention, the man would discount Richard and direct his concern to the more obvious threat of the men to his sides and back. With his fist tightly gripping the wire-wound hilt of his sword, Richard pulled a breath. The world around him seemed to go silent and still. As he reached the apex of his backward twist, he paused. Richard felt his heart begin a beat. With all his power, as people stood frozen, as the man with the knife stood at the brink of murder, as the girl's shrill scream drew out into a wire-thin sound filling the empty void in time, Richard unleashed himself in an explosive movement. With all his strength, he uncoiled. His blade erupted from its sheath, fully charged, not only with a wrath of its own, 
but with Richard's deadly resolve. At the same time, as the sword of truth rang with the unique sound of its liberation, Richard released a cry of fury. As he spun, he emptied all his rage into that roar. With every ounce of effort he had, he drove the blade around with as much speed and power as he could put behind it. In a crystal clear instant in time, Richard's vision focused on the man with the knife standing rigid with surprise. Into that void in time, Richard poured all his effort, all his muscle, all his wrath, all his need. That instant belonged to him alone, and he used it to his singular purpose. He could see the drops of sweat leave the man's face as his head snapped toward Richard. Yellow-orange light from the lanterns reflected in tiny points on those drops as they floated weightless in midair. Richard could count each point of light from each lantern in each individual droplet of sweat as his sword ever so slowly swept around. He could count each greasy strand of the man's hair as it whipped around, floating up into the air with the droplets. Richard knew that eyes all around the stable were watching, that the eyes of the girl, too, were watching, but that made no difference. The only eyes that mattered to him were the dark eyes that at last met his glare. In those black eyes, Richard could see the initiation of thought. The tip of Richard's sword whistled through the dusty air. Lantern light glinted off the razor-sharp steel. He could see the blade mirrored in the man's dark eyes. Those eyes reflected the recognition of the full dimension of the threat. Onward came the sword, sweeping like the crack of a whip toward those eyes, sweeping around toward the target Richard held in his own sight. In that instant, the man completed his thought and made the decision to act. But even in the infinitesimal fragment of time that it took to come to the conclusion of that thought, the lightning arc of the blade closed most of the distance. Even as the man's decision was being made, flinching fear from Richard's battle cry caused the man to tense. For that instant in time, the muscles of the man's arms paused as fear fought intent. It became a race to see which blade would first bite flesh. Losing that race would be irrevocable. With his gaze riveted on the man's eyes, Richard at last saw his sword flying at frightening speed, entering his line of sight. Seeing that blade again filled him with exhilaration. Driven by thundering rage, the blade caught the side of the man's head level with his dark eyes exactly where Richard intended it. In that instant, the crystal-clear moment in time that had been stretched to the breaking point shattered in sound and fury. The world went red in Richard's vision as the man's head came apart around the blade crashing through his skull. The hammer-hard sound of it thundered through the stables. Bone fragmented, crimson droplets sprayed up and away. The entire top of the skull lifted as the blade crashed through living tissue. In a long trail across the wall, bone, tissue, and blood traced the route of the sword's sweep. In that instant of shattering violence, the man's life was gone. Richard's remorseless rage shielded him from feeling the pain of any pity. The force of the sword's impact caused the arm with the knife to fall away from the girl even before the swing of Richard's sword was complete. The man's body, like nothing more than boneless meat, began collapsing. The man had decided to kill the girl, but after he had made that choice, he had not had enough time to make his blade do his bidding. Richard had. He felt his heart finish the beat it had begun when he had leaped into the narrow window of time. The man's body gathered speed as it descended until it hit the ground heavily, lifting a small cloud of dust. The top portion of his head, most of his scalp still attached, landed with a heavy thud just outside the open stable doors, bouncing and tumbling away into the night, leaving a trail of gore to trace its crooked route. Richard heard people gasp in shock. Others screamed. 
the little girl, shrieking in terror, scrambled away into her mother's outstretched arms. As he held the blade cocked, ready for any other threat, Richard met the gaze of the wide eyes of the second man, still standing in place, held fast by Victor's guards. The man made no attempt to escape or to fight. Victor charged in through a gap in the bystanders, his heavy mace raised and ready. From somewhere, Kara had appeared behind Richard, her aegeal in her fist. Richard spotted Nietzsche for the first time. She raced across the passageway, her arms held up. No, she screamed. Stop! Victor straightened in surprise. Nietzsche seized his raised wrist as if she believed he was about to slaughter the other prisoner. Stand down, blacksmith! Startled, Victor paused and let his arm drop. Nietzsche turned a furious glare on Richard. You too, carpenter. You will do as I say and stand down. Do you hear me? She screamed in fury. Richard blinked. Carpenter? Chapter 23 Through the haze of the sword's anger storming through him, Richard realized that Nietzsche had to be up to something. He didn't know her intent, but by calling both Victor and him by a trade rather than by their real names, she was sending them a signal that was too obvious to miss. She was making an emphatic bid for them to catch on to her effort and to follow her lead. Probably because people often did call him blacksmith, Victor didn't seem to get the hint. He started to open his mouth to say something. Nietzsche smacked him across the face. Silence! I will hear none of your excuses. Shocked, Victor took a step back. The shock quickly curdled into a dark scowl, but he didn't say anything. Seeing that Victor got the message to keep quiet, Nietzsche turned her ire on Richard. She shook her finger at him. You will have to answer for this, carpenter. Richard didn't have any idea what she was up to, but when their eyes met, he gave her a slight nod. He feared to do anything else, lest he spoil whatever it was she was doing. Nietzsche appeared to be worked up into a fit. What's the matter with you? She yelled at him. Where would you ever get the unacceptable idea that you can act of your own accord in such a manner? Richard didn't know what she wanted him to say, so he offered only a humble shrug, as if he were too ashamed to speak up for himself. He was saving my child, cried Jamila. That man was going to cut her throat. Nietzsche wheeled indignantly to the woman. How dare you show such little regard for our fellow man? How dare you judge what is in another man's heart? That is the Creator's exclusive right, not yours. Are you a witch woman who can see the future? If not, then you can't say what he would have done. Do you think he should be murdered for what you think he might do? Even if he would have acted, None of us alone has the authority to judge the right or wrong of whatever he did. Nietzsche turned again to Richard. What would you expect the poor man to do? The two of them are dragged in here by a mob without any charges, trial, or even being allowed to explain themselves. You treat a man like an animal and then are surprised when he acts out of confusion and fear? How do you expect Jagang the Just to ever decide to give our people another chance to do what is right and proper when we act like this? The man had a right to fear for his life when among such a mindless rabble as he saw all around him. As the mayor's wife, I will not allow such behavior. Do you hear me? The mayor will not like to hear how shamefully some of our fellow citizens have acted tonight. In the mayor's absence, I will see that our ways are upheld. Now, put away your sword. Beginning to understand what she was doing, Richard made no attempt to answer, and instead sheathed his sword as instructed. As he took his hand from the hilt, the weapon's rage extinguished. Richard's knees nearly buckled. No matter the justification, the need, the number of times he righteously used the sword, killing remained a hideous deed. Not wanting to spoil Nietzsche's act, Richard dully hung his head. She turned a fierce look on the crowd. They all took a step back. We are a peaceful people. Have you all forgotten our duty to our fellow man, to the Creator's ways? 
How can we ever expect the Emperor to someday accept us back into the fold of the Imperial Order if we behave like subhuman animals? The crowd stood mute. Richard certainly hoped that they too grasped that Nietzsche had a purpose and they should not spoil what she was trying to accomplish. As the mayor's wife, I will not allow senseless violence to poison our people and our future. A younger woman in the crowd put her hands on her hips and took a step forward. But they were... We must at all times keep in mind our duty to our fellow man, Nietzsche said in a threatening tone, cutting her off. Not our selfish desires. With a surreptitious glance to Victor, he understood her meaning and pulled the woman back to make sure she kept her mouth shut. Nietzsche glanced around at the guards. It is our responsibility to guide our fellow man, not to butcher him. One man has been murdered this night. The people's authorities will have to hear this case and decide what will become of this carpenter. Some of you will have to see to it that he is confined until then. In the meantime, as the mayor's wife, I will not allow this other man to meet a similar unjust fate. I know my husband would want to set matters right, but I also know that he would not want it to have to wait until tomorrow just for him to say as much. He would want it rectified immediately. So you will take this other citizen outside of the city and release him. Let him go on his way in peace. We will cause him no harm. The carpenter, as I said, will have to be held until he can be brought before the proper authorities to answer for his heinous deed. Victor bowed. Very wise, madam. I'm sure your husband, the mayor, would be pleased that you intervened on his behalf. Nietzsche glared at the top of his head for a moment while he was bowed before her. She then turned to stand before the second captive spy. She bowed to him. Richard noticed that somewhere along the line the cord of Nietzsche's bodice had come unlaced. It wasn't lost on the man, either. Her deep bow provided him a good long look at her cleavage. Once she straightened, it was a moment before he finally looked up into her eyes. I hope that you will accept our apology for your inhumane treatment. It is not the way we were taught to respect all people as our brothers and equals. The man made a face, as if to say he might be able to forgive his mistreatment. I can understand why you people are so touchy, what with your insurrection against the Imperial Order and all. Insurrection? Nietzsche waved a hand dismissively. Nonsense. It was little more than a misunderstanding. Some of the workers, she gestured toward Richard without looking, like these ignorant selfish men here, wanted more say for themselves and higher wages. It was nothing more than that. As my husband has often told me, it was misconstrued and blown all out of proportion. Selfish men caused an unfortunate panic that got out of control. It was much like this terrible tragedy here tonight, a misunderstanding resulting in needless harm to one of the Creator's innocent children. The man regarded her with a long, unreadable look before he spoke. And all of Alter Rong feels this way? Nietzsche sighed. Well, along with the vast majority of the people of Alto Orang, my husband, the mayor, certainly does. He's been working to bring to task the hotheads and troublemakers. Along with representatives of the people, he has worked to make these few reactionary types see what a mistake they made and what great harm they do us all. They acted without considering the greater good. My husband has brought the leaders of the trouble before the People's Council, and they have decreed the proper punishment. Most have repented. At the same time, he works to reform and re-educate the less intelligent of the lot. The man tipped his head to her in a slight bow. Please tell your husband that he is a wise man and has a wise wife who knows that her place is properly in service to the greater good. Nietzsche nodded in return. Yes, exactly, the greater good. My husband has often said that despite our own personal wishes or feelings, we must always consider the greater good above all else. That despite any personal sacrifice, we must think only of the betterment of all people and not cling to the sinful ways of individual wishes and greed. 
No one has a right to place themselves above the well-being of others. Nietzsche's words seemed to have struck a chord with the man. Such notions were the fundamental teachings and beliefs of the imperial order. She knew precisely how to strum those chords. How true, he said as he watched her, taking another long look down the gaping neckline of her dress. I guess I'd better be on my way. And where are you headed? Nietzsche asked. Her hand came up to modestly contain the sagging front of her dress. He looked back up to her face. Oh, we were just traveling through, heading farther to the south, to where we have family. We were hoping to take up some work there. I didn't know this fellow all that well. We've simply been traveling together for the last few days. Well, Nietzsche said, Considering what happened here tonight, I'm sure that my husband would suggest that for your own safety, you continue with your journey, and considering the few reactionary types still about, it would be best if you were to do so at once. There has already been one tragedy tonight. We would not like to chance another. The man passed a murderous glare across the assembled crowd. His gaze settled on Richard, but Richard kept his eyes turned to the ground. Yes. Of course, madam. Please thank the mayor for trying to bring the filthy troublemakers back to the ways of the creator. Nietzsche flicked her hand toward a few of the guards. You men, show this citizen safely out of the city. Take enough men to ensure that there will be no trouble. And I need not remind you of how displeased the mayor and the people's council would be should they discover that any harm whatsoever came to this man. He is to be allowed to go on his way. The men bowed and mumbled that they would see to it. By the way they acted, Richard could tell that they knew how to fall back into the role of what life had been like under the imperial order. All the people in the stable watched in silence as the men disappeared into the night with their charge. Long after they were gone, everyone stood still in tense silence, watching the empty doorway, fearful to speak until the man was far enough away, lest he hear anything. Well, Nietzsche said at last with a sigh, I hope that he makes it back to his fellow soldiers. If he does, then we have gone a long way toward spreading a little confusion before the battle. Oh, he will, Victor said. He will be eager to report such news as you have given him tonight. Hopefully they will be so confident that we can give them a real surprise. Let's hope so, Nietzsche said. Some of the people still remaining in the stable broke into chatter, pleased with Nietzsche's apparent stratagem of confusing the enemy. Some bid a good night and went on their way. Some stood around the corpse, staring. Nietzsche offered Victor a brief smile. Sorry to have to strike you, Victor shrugged. Well, it was to a good purpose. When Nietzsche turned to Richard, she looked uneasy, as if she feared a lecture or a reprimand. I want the troops coming this way to think they will have no trouble crushing us, she explained. Overconfidence leads to mistakes. There was more to it, Richard said. Nietzsche cast a quick glance at the people still in the stables and then eased closer to him so that others couldn't hear. You said that I could come and join up with you once the troops coming to crush the people of Alturang are destroyed. And? Her blue eyes turned as hard as iron. And I intend to see to it. Richard considered her for a time, finally deciding to let her do what she could to help the people of Alturang and not interfere with how she planned to accomplish it. Besides, he was more than a little worried about what her plan might be. Right then, he didn't really want to know what she was up to. He already had enough to worry about. Richard took the loose ends of the cords lacing her bodice, drew them tight, and retied them. She stood with her hands at her side, watching his eyes the whole time he did it. Thank you, she said when he finished. I guess that must have come undone in all the excitement. Richard ignored her lie and checked to the side to see Jamila there behind some of the other people. The woman, her cheeks swollen and red, was kneeling, hugging the frightened little girl. Richard stepped closer. How is she? Jamila looked up at him. Safe. Thank you, Lord Rahl. You saved her precious life. Thank you. As the little girl sobbed and clutched her mother, 
she eyed Richard with a look of terror, as if she feared he might slay her next. She had witnessed something terrible at Richard's hand. I'm relieved that she's safe and unharmed, he said to Jamila. Richard smiled at the girl, but received only a hateful glare in return. Nietzsche clasped his arm in empathy, but said nothing. The people still left in the stable finally spoke up to congratulate him on saving the child. They all seemed to have guessed that Nietzsche's words to the man were a ruse of some sort. Many spoke up then to tell her that they thought her deception was clever. That should throw them off, one of the men said. Richard knew that she had more planned than to simply throw them off. He was concerned about what she intended to do. He watched briefly as some of the men dragged away the dead spy. At Ishak's direction, others began quickly cleaning up the gore. The smell of blood made horses nervous, and the sooner they were rid of it, the better. The rest of the people bid Richard a safe journey and then departed for their homes. It wasn't long before they had all gone. The men cleaning up the remains finished and left. Only Nietzsche, Kara, Ishek, and Victor remained behind. The stables became a quiet and empty place. Chapter 24 Richard carefully surveyed the shadows before going to see to the horses that Ishak had collected for him. The stables felt too quiet. He remembered the hush in the room in the inn before the thing came crashing through the wall. It was not hard to find the sudden quiet menacing. He wished he had a way to know if the beast was near or if it was about to pounce. He wished he knew how to fight such a thing. His fingers touched the pommel of his sword. If nothing else, at least he had his sword and its attendant power. He remembered all too well the inhuman promises of suffering and torment left lurking within Kara for him to find. It made him nauseated and lightheaded just recalling the wordless whisper of those covenants. He had to pause and put a hand on the rail to steady himself for a moment. As he glanced over to see Kara, he still felt the wordless joy of her being alive and well. It lifted his heart just to see her looking back at him. He felt a profound connection to her as a result of the experience of healing her. He felt as if he knew the woman beneath the armor of Mord Sith a little better. Now he needed to help Kalin to see her alive and well. Two of the horses were already saddled and waiting with the supplies loaded on the others. Ishak had always been as good as his word. Richard ran his hand along the flanks of the bigger bay mare as he entered her stall, feeling her muscles and letting her know he was behind her so she wouldn't be spooked. One ear swiveled toward him. With all that had happened, to say nothing of the scent of blood in the air, the horses were all jumpy. The mare tossed her head and stomped nervously at having a stranger near. Before he went about hooking his bow to the saddle, he first stroked the mare's neck and spoke softly to her. He reached up and gently caressed her ear. He was pleased that she settled down after a little assurance. When he stepped back out from the stall, Nietzsche was watching him, waiting for him. She looked lost and lonely. You will be careful, she asked. Don't worry, Kara said as she walked past carrying some of her things. On her way into the stall, holding the smaller of the two saddled mares, she said, I will be giving him a very long lecture on the foolishness of his unthinking actions tonight. What unthinking actions? Victor asked. Kara laid an arm over the shoulder of her horse, idly running her fingers through its mane as she turned back to the blacksmith. We have a saying in the Hara, We are the steel against steel so that the Lord Rall can be the magic against magic. What it means is that it's foolish for the Lord Rall to needlessly risk his life in things like battles with blades. We can do that. But we cannot battle the magic. He alone is the one who must do that. To do so, he must be alive. Our job is keeping the Lord Rall safe from weapons of steel so that he can protect us against magic. That is the Lord Rall's duty. That is his part of the bond. 
Victor gestured toward Richard's sword. I'd say he seems to do all right with a blade. Kara arched an eyebrow. Sometimes he is lucky. Need I remind you that he almost died from getting himself shot with a simple arrow? Without a moored Sith, he would be helpless, she added for good measure. Richard silently rolled his eyes when Victor cast a worried look his way. Ishak, too, seemed concerned as he peered at Richard as if he were a stranger he was seeing for the first time. Both men had known him for nearly a year as simply Richard, a man who loaded wagons for Ishak's transport company and hauling iron to Victor's blacksmith shop. They had thought that he was married to Nietzsche. They didn't know that he had really been Nietzsche's captive at the time. Discovering that he was, in fact, the Lord Rall, the nearly mythical freedom fighter from far to the north, was still somewhat disorienting for both men. They tended to view him as one of their own who had risen up to fight tyranny with them. That was how they knew him. Whenever the Lord Rall issue came up, they got nervous, as if they suddenly didn't know how they should behave around him. As Kara went about loading the rest of her things into saddlebags, Nietzsche laid a hand on Ishak's shoulder. If you don't mind, I need to see Richard alone for a moment before he leaves. Ishak nodded. Victor and I will be outside. We have matters to discuss. As the two men made for the door, Nietzsche cast Kara a brief glance. Kara gave her horse a quick pat on the side and then followed the two men out of the stable, pulling the big door closed behind herself. Richard was amazed and just a little concerned to see Kara leave without an argument. Nietzsche stood before him in the soft lamplight, twining her fingers together and looking rather uneasy, he thought. Richard, I'm worried about you. I should be with you. You've started something tonight that I think you will have to be the one to finish. She sighed. You're right about that. Richard wondered just what it was she had started, what it was she had in mind, but he was in a hurry to leave. While he was concerned for Nietzsche's safety, he was vastly more worried about Kalin. He wanted to get going. But I still... When you're done helping these people end the immediate threat from the soldiers who are on their way here, you can catch up with me, Richard told her. With this wizard Kronos leading them, the people here are certainly going to need your help. I know. She was nodding, having already been over all of this ground already. Believe me, I intend to eliminate the threat descending upon Altur Rang. I don't intend to allow it to waste a lot of my time, and then I can leave to catch up with you. A wave of cold dread washed through him as he suddenly grasped the core of her plan. He wanted to tell her to forget what she was thinking, but he made himself keep silent. He had important and perilous work of his own that he needed to get to. He wouldn't want her telling him that he couldn't do what he had planned. Besides, she was a sorceress who knew very well what she was doing. She had been a sister of the dark, one of six such women who had managed to become his teachers at the Palace of the Prophets. When one of them had tried to kill him to steal his gift, Richard had killed her instead. That had been the beginning of the battle that had brought down the palace. Jagang eventually captured the rest, including Sister Ulyssia, their leader. In order to save Kalin's life, Richard had once allowed five of them to swear a bond to him so that they could escape the Dreamwalker's hold on them. Nietzsche hadn't been with them at the time. Another later died in the Sliff, leaving only those four Sisters of the Dark, besides Nietzsche, not in Jagang's clutches. Nietzsche was certainly a formidable threat to any who opposed her. He just hoped she wasn't taking a foolish chance just to be able to more quickly get back to protect him. Richard hooked his thumbs behind his belt not quite knowing what it was she wanted. You will be welcomed to join me whenever you can manage it. I told you that. I know. A piece of advice. He waited until her gaze turned up to his. No matter how powerful you think you are, something as simple as an arrow can still kill you. A brief smile visited her face. That advice goes both ways, wizard. 
a thought occurred to him. How will you find me? She reached up and gripped his shirt at the collar as she leaned against him. That's why I wanted to be alone with you. I will need to touch you with magic so that I can find you. Richard's suspicion flared. What kind of magic? I guess you could say that it's a little like your bond to the Daharan people which allows them to find you. Now is not the time to go into an explanation of it. Richard began to worry about why she would need to be alone with him to do such a thing. Still, gripping his shirt, she pressed against him, her eyes sliding half-closed. Just stay still, she whispered. She looked rather hesitant and reluctant about whatever it was she had planned. She looked and sounded as if she were slipping into a trance. Richard could have sworn that the lamps had been brighter before. Now the stable was dimly lit in a mellow orange glow. The hay smelled sweeter. The air felt warmer. Richard thought that perhaps he shouldn't be allowing her to do whatever it was that she intended to do. In the end, though, he decided that he trusted her. Nietzsche's left hand released its grip on his shirt and slipped up and over his shoulder to the back of his neck. Her fingers glided around his neck, her hand fisted, holding his hair at the back of his head to keep him still. Richard's level of alarm rose. He suddenly wasn't so sure that he wanted her to touch him with her power. He'd felt her magic several times before, and it wasn't something he was exactly eager to experience again. He wanted to back away, but somehow he didn't. Nietzsche leaned in even more and gently kissed his cheek. It was more than a kiss. The world around him dissolved. The stables, the humid air, the sweet aroma of hay, all seemed to cease to exist. The only thing that existed was his connection to Nietzsche, as if she were all that held him from evaporating as well. He was swept into a rising realm of breathless pleasure with all of life itself. It was an overpowering, disorienting, magnificent sensation. Everything, from the feel of the connection to her, the warmth and life of her, to all the beauty of the world, felt as if it flooded through him filling him until it saturated his mind, making him dizzy with the staggering exhilaration of it. Every kind of pleasure he had ever known swept through him with overwhelming force, amplified beyond anything he had ever experienced, engulfing him in bliss so intense that the satisfaction of it brought a gasp and tears. When Nietzsche broke the kiss on his cheek, the world inside the stables swirled back in around him, and yet it seemed more intense than it had been before, the sights and smells more vibrant than he remembered. It was quiet, but for the hiss of a nearby lamp and the soft neigh of one of the horses. Richard's hands trembled with the lingering sensation of her kiss. He didn't know if what Nietzsche had done had lasted for a second or an hour. It was magic completely unlike any Richard had ever felt before. It left him so breathless that he had to remind himself to breathe again. He blinked at her. What, what did you do? The slightest smile blossomed in the curve of her lips and in her blindingly blue eyes. I touched you with a small trace of my magic so that I can find you. I recognize my power. I will be able to follow it to you. Fear not, the effect will last long enough for me to be able to find you. I think you did more, Nietzsche. Her smile ghosted away. Her brow tightened with her concern. It took her a moment to find the words. At last, she peered at him with an intensity that told him that it was important to her that he understand. Always before, Richard, I have hurt you with magic. When I took you away, when I held you prisoner, even when I healed you, it was always hurtful or painful. Forgive me, but I wanted just once to give you a touch of magic that would not leave you being hurt by me or hating me. Her gaze sank away from his. I wanted you to have a better memory of me than of those times before when I touched you with the pain of magic. I wanted, just once, 
to give you a small trace of something pleasant instead. He could not begin to imagine what any more than a small trace would have been like. He lifted her chin, making her look up into his eyes. I don't hate you, Nietzsche, you know that. And I know that the times when you healed me, you were giving me my life. That was what counted. Finally, he was the one who had to look away from her blue eyes. It occurred to him that Nietzsche was probably the most beautiful woman he had ever met, other than Kalin. Thank you, though, he managed, still feeling the lingering effects of the sensation. She gently clutched his arm. You did a good thing tonight, Richard. I thought some pleasant magic would give you back some of your strength. I've seen a lot of people suffer and die. I couldn't stand the thought of the little girl dying, too. I meant in saving Kara's life. Oh, well, I couldn't stand the thought of the big girl dying, either. Nietzsche smiled at that. He gestured to the horses. I need to get going. She nodded, and he moved off to collect the horses and check their gear. Nietzsche went to open the stable door. After she did, Kara came back in to get her horse. Dawn was still a couple of hours off. Richard realized that he was terribly tired, especially after the emotional strain of having used his sword, but he did feel better after what Nietzsche had just done. He knew, though, that they wouldn't be getting much sleep for quite a while. They had a very long way to travel, and he fully intended to do it as swiftly as possible. By taking fresh horses with them, they would be able to ride hard, change mounts, and then continue to ride just as hard in order to make good time. He intended to ride more than hard. Nietzsche held his horse's bit as he stuffed his boot into the stirrup and swung up into the saddle. The horse flicked her tail and danced about, eager to be out of the stable even if it was still night. Richard patted her shoulder to settle her down. She would have plenty of time to show him her spirit. Kara, once in her saddle, turned to frown at him. By the way, Lord Rall, where is it we're traveling to in such a hurry? I need to go see Shota. Shota? Kara's jaw dropped. We're going to see the witch woman? Are you out of your mind? Nietzsche, suddenly mortified, rushed to his side. Going to the witch woman is madness, to say nothing of the Imperial Order troops all along the way back up through the New World. You can't do this. I have to. I think that Shota may be able to help me find Kalin. Richard, she's a witch woman. Nietzsche was beside herself. She's not going to help you. She's helped me before. She gave Kalin and me a wedding gift. I think she may remember it. A wedding gift? Kara asked. Are you crazy? Shota would just as soon kill you as not. There was more truth in that than Kara knew. His relation with Shota had always been an uneasy one. Nietzsche put a hand on his leg. What wedding gift? What are you talking about? Shota wanted Kalin to die because she feared that together we would conceive what Shota believed would be a monster child, a gifted confessor. At our wedding, as a truce, she gave Kalin a necklace with a small dark stone. It's a magic of some sort that prevents Kalin from getting pregnant. Kalin and I decided that for the time being, with all that's going on and all that we have to worry about, we would accept Shota's truce. There had been a time when the chimes had been loosed that magic of every sort had failed. For a while they hadn't known about the chimes, and that the necklace's magic had failed. It was then that Kalin had conceived a child. The men who beat her that terrible night had ended that. It was also possible that because of that brief failure of magic, the nature of the world had undergone a fundamental irrevocable change that would eventually lead to the end of all magic. Kalin certainly believed that it was happening. There had been a number of strange events that were otherwise inexplicable. Zed had called it the cascade effect. He said that once begun, such a thing could not be stopped. Richard didn't know if it was true that magic was failing or not. Shota will remember the necklace she gave Kalin. She will remember her magic, just as you will remember yours, so that you will be able to find me. If anyone will remember Kalin, Shota will. 
I've had my disagreements with the witch woman, but in the past I've also inadvertently helped her as well. She owes me. She will help me. She has to. Nietzsche threw her arms up. Of course such a thing has to be a necklace that Kalin would wear and not something that you would have. Don't you see what you're doing? Once again, your mind has invented something that conveniently can't be proven. Everything you come up with is somewhere else or something we can't see. This necklace is just more of your dream. Nietzsche pressed a hand to her forehead. Richard, this witch woman is not going to remember Kalin because Kalin doesn't exist. Shota can help me. I know she can. I know she will. I can't think of any better opportunity to get answers. Time is slipping away. The longer Kaylin is with whoever has her, the greater the danger to her life and the less my chance of helping get her back. I have to go to Shota. And what if you're wrong, Nietzsche demanded. What if this witch woman refuses to help you? I will do whatever it takes to make her help me. Richard, please put this off for at least a day or two. We can talk it through. Let me help you properly consider your options. Richard pulled the reins around, letting his horse and the ones tethered to it start toward the door. Going to Shota is my best chance of getting answers. I'm going. Richard ducked under the big doorway as they rode out into the night, out across the expanse of grounds the cicadas droned on. He pulled his horse around to see Nietzsche standing in the doorway, lit from behind by the lantern light. You be careful, he told her. If not for yourself, then for me. That at least made her smile. She shook her head in resignation. By your command, Lord Raal. He waved his farewell to Victor and Ishak. Safe journey, Ishak said as he removed his hat. Victor saluted with a fist over his heart. Come back to us when you can, Richard. Richard promised them he would. As they started down the road, Kara shook her head. I don't know why you bothered going to all the trouble to save my life. We're going to die, you know. I thought you were coming with me to prevent that from happening. Lord Rall, I don't know if I can protect you against a witch woman. I've never faced their power, nor have I heard of any Mord Sith who has. A confessor's power used to be deadly to Mord Sith. It could be that witch woman's power is just as fatal. I will do my best, but I just think you should know that I might not be able to protect you from a witch woman. Oh, I'd not worry about it, Kara, Richard said as he squeezed his legs and shifted his weight, urging his horse into a canter. If I know Shota, she won't let you get anywhere near her anyway. Chapter 25 As she marched down the side of a wide thoroughfare, leading a small knot of men, Nietzsche thought that in a way it seemed like the sun had gone out since Richard had left. She missed just being able to look into his eyes at the spark of life in them. For two days she had tirelessly gone about the urgent preparations for the imminent attack, but without Richard around, life seemed empty less bright, less, less of everything. At the same time, when he had been around, his single-minded determination to find his imagined love had been draining. In fact, she had sometimes wanted to strangle him. She had tried everything from patience to anger in an attempt to get him to come around to seeing the truth, but it had been like trying to push against a mountain. In the end, nothing she'd done or said had made any difference. For his own sake, she earnestly wanted to help him to come to grips with reality. To do so, she had to challenge him in an effort to try to get him to come to his senses before something terrible happened, but at the same time, trying to make him see the truth somehow always seemed to cast her as a villain working against him. She hated being in that position. Nietzsche hoped that by the time she finished helping to rid Alturang of the threat of the approaching Imperial Order troops and their wizard Kronos, she could quickly catch up with Richard and Kara. With spare horses, and as fast as she knew he would ride, Nietzsche realized that she would not be able to catch up with him until after he reached the witch woman, if he even made it that far, if 
Shota didn't kill him once he did. From what Nietzsche knew of witches, Richard's chances of coming out of her lair alive were pretty slim. He would have to face the witch woman without Nietzsche's help and protection. Still, he knew the woman, and she was a woman in every sense from what Nietzsche had heard of her, so maybe Richard would at least be civil. It was not at all wise to be impolite to witches. But even surviving an encounter with a witch woman, he would still be devastated if she didn't help him. And Nietzsche knew she couldn't because there was no missing woman for Richard to find. At times, it infuriated her that he was so obstinate about something so obviously nothing more than an illusion. At other times, she worried that he really was losing his mind. That was too chilling a thought to contemplate. Nietzsche paused at the side of the road with a sudden, terrible realization. The men following her lurched to a halt when she did, bringing her out of her thoughts. They were all with her either to see to her instructions in regard to some of the defenses of the city, or else to carry messages as needed. Now they stood silent and uneasy, not knowing why she had stopped. Up there, she said to the men, pointing at a three-story brick building on the corner across the street. Make sure that we can use that place to good advantage and put at least a couple dozen archers in the windows. See that they have a large supply of arrows. I will go take a look, one of the men said before running off across the road, dodging wagons, horses, and hand-drawn carts. People rushed along the side of the street, passing around Nietzsche and the men with her, as if they were a rock in a swiftly moving river. Passers-by spoke in hushed tones among themselves, as they coursed between clusters of hawkers calling out trying to sell their goods, or people gathered to urgently discuss the impending battle for the city and what they would do to protect themselves. Wagons of every sort, from big freight wagons pulled by teams of six horses to small wagons pulled by a single horse, sped past in a hurry to complete the stockpiling of provisions or other necessary work while they still could. Despite the din of horses, wagons, and people, Nietzsche didn't really hear any of it. She was thinking about the witch woman. Nietzsche had suddenly realized that Shota might not simply be unwilling to help Richard, but she might not tell him so. Witch women had their own way of doing things and their own ends. If this woman thought Richard was being too insistent or assertive, she very well might decide to get rid of him by sending him on a useless quest to the ends of the world. She very well might do such a thing simply to amuse herself, or to doom him to die a slow death on an endless march across some distant desert. A witch woman might do such a thing just because she could. Richard, in his urgency to find his fantasy woman, wouldn't consider those possibilities. He would promptly head off to where she pointed. Nietzsche was furious with herself for letting him leave to go to such a dangerous woman. But what could she do? She couldn't very well forbid him from going. Her only chance was to get rid of Brother Kronos and his troops as swiftly as possible and then go after Richard and do what she could to protect him. She spotted the man she had sent to check the brick building, sidestepping his way between the wagons and horses as he ran back across the road. Nietzsche noticed that even with all the people out traveling the roads of the city, it was still much less busy than an ordinary day. People everywhere were making preparations. Some had already holed up in places where they thought they might be safe. Nietzsche had been with the order when they swept into a city. There was no safe place. The man dodged his way around an empty wagon bouncing past, and at last reached Nietzsche's side. He stood silently waiting. He was afraid to speak unless she requested his report. He was afraid of her. Everyone was afraid of her. She wasn't just a sorceress. She was a sorceress in a bad mood, and they all knew it. No one understood why she seemed so ill-tempered, but for two days, everyone had walked on eggshells when they were around her. It had nothing to do with them, and not even anything to do with Richard racing off on his mad search for a woman who didn't exist, but none of them knew that. Nietzsche was mentally immersed in preparing herself for the ferocity of the violence to come, 
rehearsing in her mind the various things she might need to do and hardening herself to it all. When on the brink of unleashing almost inconceivable savagery, one did not hum a merry tune and remark on the lovely day. One nursed dark thoughts. Nietzsche never bothered to try to explain her mood. Going through the effort of doing so would drain some of her store of energy. Preparing in her mind to gather every bit of skill, knowledge, wisdom, and power she had at her disposal required a certain kind of withdrawal. There were violent and deadly forces these people could never begin to comprehend that she had to be ready to unleash in an instant. She couldn't explain all of that to everyone. They would just have to deal with it. Well, she calmly asked the man as he stood silently catching his breath. It will work, he said. They do knitting and make cloth there. All three floors are pretty open, so archers will be able to quickly and easily move from window to window to get the best shot. Nietzsche nodded. She put a hand to her brow to shield her eyes from the low sun as she looked back to the west along the wide boulevard. She studied the layout of the roads and the angles at which they crossed. She finally decided that the crossroads where they stood, with the brick buildings across the way, was the best spot. With as wide as both thoroughfares were, these roads would likely be the choice of enemy cavalry in the eastern part of the city. She knew the way the order ran their attacks. They liked whip so as to present the strongest front, the most powerful blow in order to break the enemy apart. She was pretty sure that they would send cavalry in this way if they came in from the east as she expected. Good, she told the man. See to getting archers here along with a heavy supply of arrows. Be quick about it. I don't think we have much time. As he ran to see to it, Nietzsche spotted Ishak in the distance, racing up the road in a wagon pulled by two of his big draft horses. He looked to be in a hurry. She had a good idea why he was coming for her, but she tried not to think about it. She turned to another of the men with her. Back there, just after the brick building where we will station the archers, I want spikes placed. The span of the road is hemmed in by buildings on both sides. She gestured to the road that crossed the main thoroughfare before the brick building. Down the street to each side as well, so that if the remaining men charging in try to take either route to escape, they will get the same. Once the enemy charged up the main route into Alturang, they would abruptly pull up the spikes to impale them. The archers would then pick off all those caught in the bottleneck between the spikes and the men still rushing up from the rear. The man nodded and ran off to see to her orders. She had already instructed everyone on the spikes. Victor had his blacksmith shop and a number of others working feverishly to manufacture the simple but deadly traps. They were little more than sharpened iron bar stock that was all connected together, almost like a picket fence, but with different length chain between the top crossbar and the upper portion of the spikes. Sections of these linked spikes were laid in the roads all over the city. Lying down flat, they didn't prevent travel on the road, but when cavalry charged in, the pointed ends of the entire section were lifted and an iron brace was jammed in place. The different length of chains attaching the spikes to the crossbar allowed the deadly spikes to hang at varying distances from the crossbar, thus making them stick up at different angles. Making them stick up at uneven angles allowed them to be far more treacherous than a simple straight line of spikes. If it was done properly, the enemy cavalry would unexpectedly run their horses right onto the sharp iron tips. Even if they tried to jump them, the horses would more likely than not be ripped open. It was simple, but highly effective. There were traps made of the iron sections all over the city, usually at intersections. Once the sections were lifted, they couldn't easily be lowered. The panicked horses would be gored on the spikes, or at the least, wouldn't be able to escape the confinement created by the obstacle. As the cavalry charged up onto the spikes, the soldiers would either be thrown off their horses and likely injured or killed, or they would have to dismount in order to try to deal with the obstruction. Either way, the archers would then have a much better chance of picking them off than if they were just charging past. 
The men manning the sections of spikes were instructed to judge the situation and not to necessarily pull the spikes up just as the cavalry ran up to them. In some cases, it would be better to wait until some of the men had already charged past. If there was a large number of cavalry, this would allow the defenders to split the enemy force, not only spreading confusion among the attack, but breaking it apart, severing the lines of command, making it lose its advantage of unity and making it easier to deal with the fragmented force. Decisively eliminating the cavalry was essential to stopping the invasion. Nietzsche knew, though, that in the panic of facing a frightening wall of charging enemy soldiers screaming for blood, such careful plans tended to be forgotten. She knew that at the sight of such fearsome soldiers with weapons raised, some of the men would flee, failing to raise the spikes before they did. Nietzsche had seen such terror before. That was why she had placed redundant sections of spikes. Nearly everyone in the city was committed to its defense. Some would be more effective than others. Even women at home with children had supplies of things, from rocks to boiling oil, that they intended to throw down on any invading soldiers. There had not been a lot of time to make extravagant weapons, but there were men everywhere with stacks of spears. A sharpened pole wasn't fancy, but if it took down a cavalry horse or impaled a man, it was fancy enough. It didn't matter if it was cavalry or foot soldiers, they all had to be defeated. So there were men of the city by the thousands with bows. With a bow, even an old man could kill a vigorous, muscular, hulking young soldier. An arrow could even take down a wizard. Page 253. It would be futile to have the men of the city trying to fight experienced soldiers in a traditional battle. They had to deny the order's soldiers everything they were used to using. Nietzsche's object had been to make the city one big trap. Now she had to draw the order into that trap. To that end, she saw Ishak's wagon rumbling toward her. People scattered out of the way. Ishak pulled back on the reins and drew the big horses to a halt. A cloud of dust boiled up. He set the brake and leaped down off the wagon, something she wouldn't have expected he could do with such agility. He held his hat on with one hand as he ran. He was holding something else up in his other hand. Nietzsche! Nietzsche! She turned to the men with her. You'd all best see to the things we've discussed. I don't think we have more than a few hours. The men looked surprised and alarmed. You don't think they will wait until morning? One asked. No, I believe they will attack this evening. She didn't tell them why she thought so. The men nodded and rushed off to their assignments. Ishak came to a panting halt. His face was nearly as red as his hat. Nietzsche, a message. He waved the paper before her. A message for the mayor. Nietzsche's insides tightened. A group of men rode in, he said. They were carrying a white flag, just as you said they would. They brought a message for the mayor. How did you know? She ignored the question. Have you read it yet? His face went red. Yes, so did Victor. He is very angry. It is not a good thing to make the blacksmith angry. Do you have a horse, as I requested? Yes, yes, I have a horse. He handed her the paper. But I think that you had better read this. Nietzsche unfolded the paper and read it silently to herself. Citizen Mayor, I received word that the people of Altur Rang, under your direction, wish to renounce their sinful ways and bow again to the wise, merciful, and sovereign authority of the Imperial Order. If it is true that you wish to spare the people of Altur Rang the total destruction we reserve for insurrectionists and heathens, then as a token of your good intent and willing submission to the jurisdiction of the Imperial Order, you will bind your lovely and loyal wife's hands and send her to me as your humble gift. Fail to turn over your wife as instructed, and everyone in all to a wrong will die. In the service of the merciful creator, Brother Kronos, commander of His Excellency's Reunification Force. Nietzsche crushed the message in her fist. Let's go. Ishak replaced his hat and scrambled to catch up with her as she marched toward the wagon. 
You don't seriously intend to do as this brute demands, do you? Nietzsche put a foot on the iron step and climbed up onto the wagon's wooden seat. Let's go, Ishak. He muttered to himself as he climbed into the wagon beside her. He threw off the brake and flicked the reins, yelling for people to get out of the way as he swung the wagon around. Dirt and dust spiraled up off the wheels as he turned the wagon around in the road. He cracked his whip above the horse's flanks, crying out to urge them away. The wagon slid around and finally straightened as the horses threw their weight against the hames. Nietzsche held on to the side rail with one hand as the wagon lurched ahead, letting her other hand, with the message crumpled in her fist, rest in the lap of her red dress. She watched without seeing as they raced through the streets of Altur Rang, past buildings and storefronts, other wagons, horses, and people on foot. Low sunlight flickered through rows of trees to the left as they raced north along the wide boulevard. At vegetable, cheese, bread, and butcher stands under awnings, some drab and some striped, a press of people were buying up all the food they could before the impending storm. The road narrowed as it passed into ancient sections of the city, becoming clogged with wagons, horses, and people. Without slowing much at all, Ishak swung his two big draft horses off the main road and took shortcuts through alleyways behind tightly packed rows of buildings where entire families lived in a single room. Laundry stretched on lines that crisscrossed small yards, and in a number of places, strung between opposing second-story apartments, stretched across the alleyway over their heads. Nearly each tiny plot in the back of the crowded buildings was used for growing food or keeping chickens. Wings flapped and feathers flew as the birds panicked at the sight of the wagon thundering past their yard. Ishak deftly handled the team as it raced at a frightening speed, guiding them around obstacles of shacks, fences, walls, and random trees. He called out warnings as he charged across busy roads. Startled people drew back, letting him pass. The wagon turned up a street Nietzsche remembered all too well, following beside a short wall that eventually curved it along the entrance road to the warehouse doors of Ishak's transport company. The wagon bounced into the rutted yard outside the building and came to a crooked halt in the shade of huge oaks rising above the wall. Nietzsche climbed down as she saw one of the double doors opening. Apparently having heard the noise, Victor emerged from the building, glowering like he intended to murder the next person he could get his hands on. Have you seen the message? he demanded. Yes, I have. Where's the horse I asked for? He pointed a thumb back over his shoulder toward the open door. Well, what are we going to do now? The attack will probably come at dawn. We can't allow those soldiers to take you back with them to the army. We can't let them leave and report that we won't do as Kronos demands. What are we going to tell them? Nietzsche tilted her head toward the building. Ishak, would you go get the horse, please? He made a sour face. You ought to marry Richard. You make a good pair. You are both crazy. Startled, Nietzsche could only stare at the man. She finally found her voice. Ishak, please, we don't have a lot of time. We don't want those fellows to go back empty-handed. Yes, your highness, he mocked. Allow me to get your royal mount for you. I've never seen Ishak act like that, she said to Victor as she watched the man stalking toward the door, muttering curses under his breath. He thinks you're crazy, so do I. Victor planted his fists on his hips. Has that ruse back at the stables with the spy gone bad? Or is this what you planned all along? In no mood to discuss it with the man, Nietzsche returned the glare in kind. My plan, she said through gritted teeth, is to get this over with as soon as possible and to keep the people of Alturang from being slaughtered. What's that got to do with turning you over to Brother Kronos as a gift? If we allow them to attack at dawn, they will have the advantage. We need them to attack today. Today? Victor glanced west toward the low sun. But it will be dark soon. Exactly, she said as she leaned in the back of the wagon and retrieved a length of rope. Victor stared off at the heart of the city as he thought about it. Well, all things considered, I guess it would be better not to face them in the day on their terms. 
If we could somehow get them to attack today, they would soon run out of daylight. That would work to our advantage. I will bring them to you, she said. You just be ready. The creases across Victor's forehead deepened. I don't know how you're going to get them to attack today, but we'll be ready if they do. Ishak came out of the warehouse leading a white stallion covered with mottled black spots. The mane, tail, and legs below the hocks were black. The horse looked not only elegant, but had a tough demeanor about him, as if it would have boundless endurance. Still, it wasn't what she had been expecting. He doesn't look all that big, she said to Ishak. Ishak gave the horse an affectionate rub on its white face. You did not say big. You said that you wanted a steady horse that would not spook easily, one that had a fearless spirit. Nietzsche took another look at the horse. I just assumed that such a horse would be big. She's a crazy woman, Ishak muttered to Victor. She's going to be a dead crazy woman, Victor said. Nietzsche handed Victor the rope. This will be easier if you stand on the wall after I'm mounted. She stroked the horse under his jaw and then his silky ears. The animal nickered his appreciation and nudged his head against her. Nietzsche held his head and trickled a thin thread of her hahn into the creature, giving him a bit of calming introduction. She ran a hand over his shoulder and then along the side of his belly as she inspected him. Without comment, Victor climbed up the wall and waited until she boosted herself up and was seated in the saddle. Nietzsche arranged the skirts of her red dress and then unbuttoned it to the waist. She pulled her arms out of the sleeves one at a time, holding the front of the dress against her chest and then holding it up with her elbows as she lifted her hands toward Victor, her wrists pressed together. Victor's face went as red as her dress. Now what are you doing? These men are experienced Imperial Order troops. Some will be officers. I spent a lot of time in the Order's camp. I was widely known, to some as the Slave Queen and to others as Death's Mistress. It's possible that certain of these men may have served in Jagang's army during that time, and so they very well may recognize me, especially if I were to wear a black dress. Just in case, I'm wearing a red dress. I also need to give these men something to stare at to keep them off guard and hopefully from recognizing me. It will disrupt the usual calculating judgment of soldiers such as these. It will also get Cronus's attention and make him think that the mayor is desperate to appease him. Nothing rouses the bloodlust in these kind of men more than weakness. It's going to get you in trouble before you even get to Kronos. I'm a sorceress. I can take care of myself. Seems to me that Richard is a wizard and carries a sword charged with ancient magic, and even he got into trouble when he was greatly outnumbered. He was overpowered and nearly killed. Nietzsche again lifted her hands out toward Victor, wrists together. Tie them. Victor glared at her a moment before finally giving in. With a growl, he set about binding her wrists. Ishak held the reins just under the horse's bit as he waited. Is this horse fast? she asked, as she watched Victor wrapping rope around her wrists. Sardine is fast, Ishak told her. Sardine? Doesn't that mean the wind in the old tongue? Ishak nodded. You know the old tongue? A little, she said. Today, Sardine will need to be as swift as the wind. Now listen to me, both of you. I don't intend on getting myself killed. Few people do, Victor griped. You don't understand. This will be the best chance to get near Kronos. Once the attack begins, it would be difficult not only to find him, but even if we did know where he was, it would be next to impossible to get close to him. He would be dealing death against the innocent in ways you cannot even imagine, spreading fear, panic, and death. That makes him valuable to them. In battle, their soldiers will be looking for anyone trying to take out their wizard. I have to do it now. I intend to end it tonight. Victor and Ishak shared a look. I want everyone to be ready, she said. When I come back, I expect there will be some very angry people behind me. Victor looked up after yanking the knot tight. How many angry people? 
I intend to have their entire force right on my heels. Ishak gently rubbed Sardine's face. What are they going to be angry about, if I may ask? Besides trying to take out their wizard, I intend to give the hornet's nest a good stiff whack. Victor sighed irritably. We'll be ready for them when they attack, but once you go in there, I'm not so sure you will be able to get away. Nietzsche wasn't either. She remembered a time when she went about her plans not caring if she lived or died carrying them out. Now she cared. If I don't come back, then you will just have to do your best. Hopefully, even if they kill me, I will be able to take Kronos out with me. Either way, we've laid a lot of surprises for them. Does Richard know what you had planned? Ishak asked as he squinted up at her. I expect he knew. He had the good grace, though, not to make me feel any more afraid by arguing with me about what I know I must do. This is not a game. We are all fighting for our very lives. If we fail, then innocent, decent people are going to be slaughtered in numbers that stagger the imagination. I've been on the other end of attacks like this. I know what's coming. I'm trying to prevent it. If you don't want to help, then just stay out of my way. Nietzsche looked at each man in turn. Chagrined, they both kept silent. Victor went back to his work and quickly finished up with binding her wrists. He pulled a knife from his boot and sliced off the excess length of rope. Who do you want to take you to the soldiers who are waiting? Ishak asked. I think you'd better take me, Ishak. While Victor alerts everyone and sees to the preparations, you will be a representative of the mayor. All right, he said as he scratched the hollow of his cheek. Good, she said as she picked up the reins. Before she could say anything, Victor cleared his throat. There is one other matter I've been meaning to talk to you about, but we've both been busy. Victor uncharacteristically looked away from her. What is it? she asked him. Well, ordinarily, I wouldn't say anything, but I think maybe you ought to know. Know what? People are beginning to question Richard. Nietzsche frowned. Question him? What do you mean? Question him in what way? Word has gotten around about why he left. People are worried that he is abandoning them and their cause to chase phantoms. They question if they should be following such a man. There is talk that he's... that he's, you know deranged or something. What should I tell them? Nietzsche took a deep breath as she collected her thoughts. This was what she had feared. This was one of the reasons she had thought it important that he not leave, especially the way he did right before the attack. Remind them, she said as she leaned toward him, that Lord Rahl is a wizard and a wizard can see things such as hidden distant threats that they cannot. A wizard does not go around explaining his actions to people. The Lord Rahl has many responsibilities other than just this one place. If the people here wish to live free, to live their own lives as they wish, then they must choose to do so for their own sake. They must trust that Richard, as the Lord Rahl and as a wizard, is off doing what is best for our cause. And do you believe that? The blacksmith asked. No, but there is a difference. I can follow the ideals he has shown me while at the same time working to bring Richard back to his senses. The two are not incompatible. But the people must trust in their leader. If they think he is a madman, they may fall back on fear and give up. Right now we can't afford that risk. Whether Richard is sane or not, it doesn't change the validity of the cause. The truth is the truth, Richard or no Richard. Those troops coming to murder us are real. If they win, then those who are not killed will be enslaved once more under the yoke of the imperial order. If Richard is alive, dead, sane, or mad, it does not change that fact. Victor, his arms folded, nodded. Nietzsche moved her leg back and pressed her heel into Sardine's side, moving his rump closer to the wall. She turned the back of her shoulders to the blacksmith standing on that wall beside her. Pull my dress down to my waist and be quick about it. The sun will be setting soon. Ishak turned away, shaking his head. Victor hesitated a moment, then sighed in resignation and did as she had instructed. 
All right, his shack, let's go. Lead the way. She looked back over her shoulder at Victor. I will bring you the enemy chasing the setting sun. What should I tell the men? Victor asked. Nietzsche shrouded herself in the cold exterior she had used so often throughout her life, the cold calm of death's mistress. Tell them to think dark and violent thoughts. For the first time, Victor's glower twisted into a grim smile. Chapter 26 The soldiers atop huge war horses peered down at Nietzsche as Ishak led her horse to a stop beside the community well in the small square at the eastern edge of the city. Her stallion, Sadine, felt small in the presence of such huge beasts. Armored plate down the front of their heads lent them a threatening appearance. These were cavalry horses, and the armor helped protect them from arrows as they charged enemy lines. They pawed the ground and snorted their disdain for the smaller horse come among them. Sadine backed a step, just out of range of one of the war horse's teeth when it snapped, but he didn't shy away. If the horses looked to be frightening animals, the men were clearly their masters. Dressed in dark leather armor plates and shirts of chain mail and carrying an array of sinister weapons, these men were not merely brutish looking, but larger than any of the men defending the city. Nietzsche knew that they would have been selected for the mission because of the way they looked. The order liked sending such intimidating messages to strike fear into the hearts of their enemies. From dark windows, recessed doorways, narrow streets, and the shadows in alleyways, people who had retreated out of the open watched the woman stripped to her waist, her wrists bound, being handed over to the soldiers. Nietzsche had endured the ride through the city by not thinking about it, and instead focusing on her need to get this over with so she could catch up with Richard. That was what mattered. So people looked at her. What difference did it make? She had had to endure far worse at the hands of the men of the order. I am an aide to the mayor, Ishak said in a subservient tone to the powerfully built man atop a towering brown bull neck gelding. The butt of the pole with the white flag rested on the man's saddle between his legs, his meaty fist gripping it halfway up the length of the stout shaft. The man sat mute, waiting. Ishak licked his lips as he bowed before going on. He sent me in his place with his woman, his wife, as a gift to the great Kronos to show our sincerity in agreeing with his wishes. The soldier, a mid-level officer of some sort, smirked at Nietzsche after taking a long and deliberate look at her breasts. Broad leather belts held several knives, a flail, a short sword, and a crescent-bladed axe. The mail and metal rings along studded straps crossing his broad chest jangled when his horse stomped its hooves. She was relieved not to recognize the man and kept her head turned down to hide her face from the men with him. Still, the officer said nothing. With one hand, Ishak swept his hat off his head. Please relay our message of peace to... The officer tossed the pole with the white flag down to Ishak. Ishak swiftly replaced his hat in order to catch the pole with one hand, his other still tightly gripping the reins just below Sardine's bit. The pole looked heavy, but Ishak had been loading wagons for most of his life and had no trouble with it. Kronos will let you know if the offering is satisfactory, the officer growled. Ishak cleared his throat rather than say anything else and again bowed politely. The soldiers all snickered at him before taking another knowing look at Nietzsche's exposed condition. They obviously greatly enjoyed exerting their dominance over others. Most of them had metal rings or pointed metal rivets pierced through their nose, ears, and cheeks in an attempt to make them look more fierce. Nietzsche thought that it simply made them look silly. Several of the dozen men had wild, dark, tattooed designs sweeping across their faces, also intended to intimidate. These were men who had risen to their highest ideal in life, to be savages. It was somewhat common for many of the women in the cities surrendering to advancing imperial-ordered troops 
to come out stripped to the waist as a petition for leniency. Because it was such a common form of submission, the soldiers were not at all surprised by the manner in which the wife of the mayor was being surrendered. That, of course, was one of the reasons why Nietzsche had done it. Such bids for mercy and gentle treatment were never honored, but the women who offered themselves in such a manner didn't know that. Nietzsche knew because she had often been with the ordered troops when they took such women captive. Such obliging people imagined that surrender in such a subservient manner would be ingratiating and elicit reasonable treatment. They had no idea that they had willingly given themselves over to incomprehensible horrors. The soldiers' treatment of women captives was dismissed by the intellectuals of the order as a trivial matter compared to the greater good the order was bringing to the non-believers. Nietzsche sometimes longed for death rather than continue to live with such memories and the knowledge that she had once been a party to such horrors. What she wanted now, though, was to set things right as only she could do. She wanted to participate in wiping the scourge of the order from existence. The grim officer who had carried the white flag into al Turang bent down and now took the reins to her horse from Ishak. He stepped his mount close to her. As he leaned toward her, he casually seized her left nipple, twisting it as he spoke intimately to her. Brother Kronos tires quickly of a woman, no matter how beautiful she is. I expect it will be no different with you. When he moves on to the next, he gives us the one he is finished with. Know that I will be first. The men with him chuckled. He flashed her a grin. His dark eyes gleamed with menace. He twisted harder until she gasped in pain and tears stung her eyes. Satisfied with himself and her timid reaction, he released her. Nietzsche squeezed her eyes shut as she pressed the back of her bound wrists to herself, trying to ease the throbbing pain. When he batted her arms away from her breast, she jumped in surprise, then lowered her gaze in submission. How many times had she seen women do similar things, trying to appease such men, praying silently for deliverance as they did so? For those women, deliverance never came. Nietzsche recalled thinking at the time that the Order's teachings had to be right, that the Creator really was on their side, for he easily tolerated such behavior from his champions. Nietzsche did not bother to pray for deliverance. She intended to create her own. As the man turned his horse and led her away, Nietzsche cast one last look over her shoulder at Ishak, standing with his red hat in both hands, turning the brim around and around in his fingers. His eyes glistened with tears. She hoped that this wasn't the last time she would ever see him or the others, but she knew that such a possibility was all too real. The officer kept a hold of the reins, so she rode gripping the horn of the saddle. As they rode east, the company of men closely surrounded her, more to get a good look at her, she thought, than from any worry that she might escape. By the way they swayed easily in their saddles and deftly handled their mounts, these were experienced horsemen who spent the majority of their waking hours in the saddle. They had no fear of her getting away from them. As they rode east on a dusty road, the men all grinned their silent promises whenever they looked her over. She knew, though, that none of them had enough rank or stature to dare to drag her off her horse for a little sport along the way. Men like Kronos did not appreciate their conquests freshly raped, and these men knew it. Besides, they were surely figuring that they would soon enough have their turn at her, and if not her, then their pick once they stormed into Altuorang. Nietzsche tried to ignore the leering men by concentrating on what she had to do. She knew that such behavior was part of their routine. They could think of nothing more clever than simple innuendo and intimidation, so they used it like a worry stone turned over and over in the fingers. As she rode, her resolve became her refuge. It would still be a while before the low sun at her back set, but already the cicadas had started in with their endless droning song. They reminded her of Richard and the night he had explained about the creatures that emerged from the ground every 17 years. 
It seemed remarkable that the cicadas had come ten times in her life and Nietzsche had never even realized it. Life under the spell at the Palace of the Prophets had not simply been very long, but had been insulating in ways she had never even realized. While the world went on around her, she had been devoting her time to other worlds. Others, like the Sisters of the Dark, who had been Richard's teachers there, had succumbed to seductive promises from those other worlds. Nietzsche had as well, but not because of those promises. She had simply believed that this world held nothing of value to her. Until one day, when Richard had shown up. The air was warm and humid, so at least Nietzsche wasn't cold as she rode, but the mosquitoes were starting to come out, and they were becoming obnoxious. She was glad that her hands weren't tied behind her back, so she could at least keep the biting bugs off her face. The wheat-covered hills they passed through to the east of the city shimmered a greenish gold in the late light, almost like burnished bronze. She didn't see any people working in the countryside, and the roads remained empty. Everyone had fled before the impending arrival of the army, like animals before a wildfire. Cresting a hill, Nietzsche finally saw them, men and horses from the imperial order spread out across the broad valley below her like a dark flood. It appeared they hadn't been there long, as it looked like they were only starting to set up camp. Apparently, they wanted to be close to the city so that when they began their attack in the morning, they wouldn't have far to go. The ground was only just beginning to be churned up by all the men, horses, mules, and wagons. Individual territory had been staked out and small tents erected. Rings of sentries and outposts guarded the sea of men. Every hilltop had lookouts watching all the approaches. The tents cast long shadows across the trampled wheat. Already a haze of smoke hung over the valley from all the cook fires. Nietzsche could see that one of the nearby olive groves had been stripped of its valuable fruit trees to be used for firewood. Men cooked for themselves or in small groups. Simple things, camp stew, rice and beans, bannock and fritters. The aroma of the burning wood and cooking mingled uneasily with the smell of all the animals, men, and manure. Her escort kept a tight formation around her as they trotted into the camp along what was quickly becoming a temporary road among the seething throng. Nietzsche had expected to see them in a raucous state, drinking and celebrating on the eve of a great battle. They were not. They were going about the business of preparing in earnest for the job ahead, sharpening weapons, working on saddles and other gear, tending to horses, lances and spears were already sharpened and neatly stacked all over the camp. Blacksmiths at a traveling forge worked with tongs and hammers as helpers feverishly pumped bellows. Farriers shod horses while other men mended leather equipment. Cavalry horses were being fed, cared for, and groomed. This was not a typical imperial order camp where chaos ruled. The army to the north was almost unimaginably vast. Many parts of it were little more than an unruly mob that was periodically unleashed on helpless civilians and allowed to plunder at will. This force, on the other hand, was much smaller, consisting of less than 20,000 men. This was the camp of a well-honed war machine. In the main army camp of the Imperial Order, a woman with her breasts exposed as Nietzsche's were would already have been dragged from her horse by a rabble and raped. These men were no less lecherous, but they were far better disciplined. These were not just any soldiers sent to do some dirty work. These were experienced, dedicated, hand-picked troops sent to vent the emperor's rage at the insult of his home city rejecting everything for which he stood. Nietzsche felt a shiver of dread at again being among such men. These were the cream of the order's crop. These were men who gleefully killed all those who opposed them. These were brutes who reveled in violence to further their beliefs. These were the embodiment of the term bloodthirsty. These men were the enforcers of the order's doctrines. As Nietzsche and her escort rode through the camp, the soldiers all ogled her. 
Every step of the way, hoots, calls, and cheering followed her. Obscene promises were laughingly given as she passed. Nothing was left to the imagination of anyone in earshot. She heard herself described in every lewd term she had ever heard before, and among Jagang's men she had heard them all. Now they were all directed at her. She kept her eyes ahead as she rode, thinking of the way Richard treated her and just how much such respect meant. Near a grove of cottonwood trees along the bank of a creek running through the valley, Nietzsche spotted lambskin tents that were a little larger than the rest. While by no means elaborate accommodations like the tents of Emperor Jagang's entourage, these were still luxurious by army standards. The small group of command tents sat atop a hillock that afforded the officers the opportunity to look down on the rest of the camp. Unlike the main army encampment, here there was no ring of guards protecting the elite forces and officers from the common soldiers. Outside the main tent, slabs of meat were being rotated on spits by slaves that always attended the higher ranking officers or high priests of the fellowship of order. For a force such as this, only the most loyal slaves would have been brought along. As they slowed to a halt, the man who held the reins to Nietzsche's horse tilted his head, ordering one of his men to go announce them. The man threw his leg over his horse's neck and jumped to the ground. With each step, dust lifted from his pants as he strode toward the main tent. Nietzsche noticed that all around, curious men began wandering closer coming to see the woman being brought as a gift for their leader. She could hear them laughing and wisecracking among themselves as they leered at her. Their eyes were as cold and frightening as any she had ever seen. What worried her the most, however, was that many of the men held spears or had arrows knocked in their bows. These were not men who took anything casually. Even as they drooled at her, they were prepared for any kind of threat her appearance might present. The man sent to announce her was ushered into the main tent by an attendant. A moment later, he reappeared, followed by a tall man in flowing henna-dyed robes. His manner of dress stood out on the drab scene like clotted blood. Despite the heat and humidity, the hood of his robe was draped regally over his head, a sign of pious authority. He stalked to the edge of the rise, closer to her, and struck an arrogant pose. He took his time looking her over, inspecting the goods. The man holding the reins to her horse bowed in his saddle. A humble gift from the people of Alturang, he explained with mock courtliness. Men far and wide laughed quietly to themselves at that commenting to one another on the specific pleasures Kronos was going to enjoy from his gift. Officers came out of nearby tents to see what was going on. A lustful grin spread across Kronos's face. Bring her in. I will have to unwrap the gift and have a closer look. The men laughed all the louder. Kronos's smile widened, pleased that they found his wit entertaining. Nietzsche found the circumstances of her dress to be distracting, but that was the risk. She had judged the risk necessary. These men were brutes, and they found her situation to their liking. Brother Kronos took her in as he waited for her to be conveyed inside. Her unflinching gaze was riveting. She found herself staring into his dark eyes. Men closed in around her. Nietzsche knew that she couldn't allow them to get her off her horse. It had to be now. There were a thousand things she wanted to say to Brother Kronos. She wanted to tell him what she thought of him, what she was going to do to him, what Richard was going to do to all the Imperial Order. A simple death seemed too easy for Kronos. She wanted him to suffer before he died. She wanted him to know full well what she had in store for him. She wanted him to feel it, to twist in pain and agony, to beg for mercy, to taste the bitter bile of defeat. She wanted him to suffer for the misery he spread in his wake. She wanted him to pay the price for everything he had ever done to innocent people. She wanted him to know that his entire life had been a waste and that it was about to end. But she knew that that was not her task. 
she would risk failure should she even attempt to accomplish any tiny part of it. Instead, Nietzsche unceremoniously lifted her fists just a little toward the man as she willed forth her Han. Fearing to tip Kronos as to what was coming, she refrained from taking even an extra split second to conjure anything elaborate. She opened the floodgates using nothing more complex than a blast of air directed at the man. But it was concentrated beyond anything he would expect, even if he suspected she might be a sorceress. In a blinding instant, the late afternoon camp was lit with a flash of crackling light. Discharges created by the intense heat generated by a focused compression of air. Threads of light lashed around the convergent release of force. Since even a slight slip could conceivably give him an opportunity to strike out before he died, Nietzsche didn't even risk the satisfaction of smiling as the iron-hard spike of air shot for his head. Before Brother Kronos ever realized that something was happening, Nietzsche's sudden release of power blew a fist-sized hole through the center of his forehead. Blood and brain matter sprayed the lambskin wall of the tent behind him. He dropped like a sack of sand, his life already long gone. He never had a chance to respond in kind. Nietzsche used a shard of power to at last sever the ropes binding her wrists. They hissed from the sting of heat as they were cut and then dropped away. Without pause, she fed a flow of her Han into a focused line of power that she swept around her like a blade wielded by a master swordsman. The officer who had led her horse and leered at her the whole way grunted as the hot edge ripped through him, cutting him in two below the rib cage. His mouth opened, but no scream escaped as his upper half tumbled toward the ground, landing with a hard thud. With a wet thump, the second man could do more than gasp as he was hit by the same power and torn in two. Coiled ropes of his intestines disgorged across his horse's neck. Nietzsche twisted in her saddle as she whipped the conjured blade around in an arc. With frightening speed and a flash that lit the shimmering leaves of the nearby cottonwood trees, the edge of deadly power sizzled as it ripped through the air. Before anyone could begin to react, it cut down all the men on horses around her as they still sat in their saddles. The air filled with the stench of burned flesh, blood, and the contents of ruptured viscera. Horses reared up or bucked, trying to rid themselves of the disembodied legs. Ordinarily, war horses were used to the confusion of intense battle, but that was in large part because they had familiar riders to control and direct them. Now they were on their own, and they were spooked. A number of men rushing in were knocked down and trampled by the panicked horses, further adding to the disorder. As pandemonium began to erupt all around her, as men charged in toward her, Nietzsche gathered her inner will, preparing to unleash an onslaught of withering destruction. Just as she was initiating the launch of that deadly assault, she pitched forward unexpectedly. At the same time, she felt the stunning pain of something heavy clouting her across her back. It was propelled by such staggering force that it drove her breath out with a cry. She saw flying past her the shattered pieces of a heavy lance that had been swung like a club. Dazed, Nietzsche realized that she had just hit the ground face first. She tried desperately to gather her senses. Her face felt oddly numb. She tasted warm blood. She saw strings of it dripping from her chin as she pushed herself up on wobbly arms. She realized then that she couldn't pull in a breath, that the wind had been violently knocked out of her. She frantically tried again, but despite her desperate efforts, she couldn't draw a breath. The world swam in dizzy disarray around her. Sadin was above her, dancing about, but unable to move away. Even though Nietzsche feared that the horse might accidentally step on her, she couldn't make herself move out of the way. Men all around finally muscled the horse aside. Other men dropped to their knees beside her. A knee in her back flattened her to the ground again. Powerful hands gripped her arms, her legs, her hair, holding her down, as if she could get up on her own. These men apparently feared that if she got up, she might conjure her power, as if the gifted needed to be standing, and they had but to keep her on the ground to be safe. 
but the gifted didn't need to have their wits about them if they were to call upon their power, and she didn't. Some of the men pulled her over on her back. A boot at her throat kept her pinned to the ground. Weapons all around pointed down at her. And then a terrible thought came to her. Dark eyes. The wizard she had just killed had dark eyes. Kronos didn't have dark eyes. Kronos was supposed to have blue eyes. She was having difficulty sorting it all out in her mind. She had killed the high priest. It didn't make sense. Unless there had been more than one brother. The men holding her down backed away. Grim blue eyes glared down at her. It was a man wearing long robes. The hood was pulled up. A high priest. Well, sorceress, you have just managed to kill Brother Byron, a loyal servant to the Fellowship of Order. She could tell by his tone that he had not yet begun to voice his building anger. Through the shock, Nietzsche still couldn't draw a breath. The pain in her back radiated out in paralyzing waves. She wondered if the man who had clubbed her had broken her ribs. She wondered if her back was broken. She supposed it didn't matter now. Allow me to introduce myself, the red-faced man above her said. He pushed the hood of his robes back. I am Brother Kronos. You belong to me now. I intend to make you pay a long and painful price for the murder of a good man who was only doing the Creator's noble work. Chapter 27 Nietzsche couldn't, simply couldn't, pull in a breath to save her life, much less to say anything. The pain of not being able to breathe cloaked her in a tight shroud of panic that prevented her from thinking. The distress of needing air and not being able to get it grew more terrifying with every passing second. She didn't know what to do. She remembered when Richard had been shot with the arrow and he couldn't breathe. She remembered how his skin had turned ashen and then had begun turning blue. She had been so afraid seeing him not being able to breathe. Now she couldn't. Kronos's smile was as humorless and wicked as any she had ever seen, but it seemed not to matter to her. Quite an accomplishment for a sorceress, killing a wizard. But then you only accomplished such a feat by treachery, so it was no real accomplishment after all. It was nothing more than simple underhanded deceit. He didn't know. Nietzsche realized that he still didn't know who she was or what she was. She was no mere sorceress. But she needed a breath to be anything. Her vision was narrowing to a black tunnel with the face of the wizard Kronos twisting into rage at the far end. She tried with all her might to pull a breath. It felt like her body had forgotten how to breathe. It surprised her that the lack of air made her ribs throb and ache. She wouldn't have expected that. Despite her fading, frantic effort to get air into her lungs, the life-giving breath simply would not come into her. She could only assume that whoever had clubbed her had done some kind of serious damage, and she would never again draw a life-giving breath. And then Kronos gritted his teeth and seized her breast in a vicious, vice-like grip, spiked with thorns of magic intended to inflict excruciating torment. The sudden sharp shock of pain made her gasp a breath before she realized she was doing it. The air felt hot with life as it flooded into her lungs. Without conscious thought, she instinctively struck out with her Han at the cause of the piercing pain. Kronos cried out, and staggered back, cradling the hand that had been on her and dealing out his revenge. Blood ran down his wrist and under the sleeve of his robe. Although she had been able to get him to release her, and even to injure him, she was still too disoriented to muster the force necessary to get past the formidable defenses of a wizard in order to kill him. She panted, gulping air, even though each breath hurt. She knew, though, that it hurt far more not to be able to get a breath. You filthy bitch, he yelled, 
How dare you use your power against me? You cannot hope to match me with the gift. You will soon enough learn your place. His face flushed red with anger. With a thin thread of her Han, Nietzsche could sense the powerful shields the man had erected before himself. Before he had, though, she had seared the flesh off his fingers. He held the trembling hand to his breast. She knew full well that his intent was to extract prolonged and gruesome retribution. He ranted at her, cursing and calling her names, telling her what he intended to do with her and what would become of her once he was finished with her. The grins of the men watching widened at hearing the nature of those plans. He thought she was a sorceress and that he could overpower her gift with his. He did not know that she was far more. She had become a sister of the dark. Even if he knew that much, Kronos might not have understood, as few people did, the full and terrible meaning behind that appellation. A sister of the dark wielded not only her own gift, but the Han of a wizard as well. His gift was taken before he passed through the veil into death. As if the combined gift of a sorceress and wizard was not formidable enough, added into that powerful mix was subtractive magic, gained while the veil was parted at the instant of the donor wizard's death. His own Han acted as the conduit, and she held within herself that power as the subtractive essence slipped through the veil. There were few people who could command subtractive magic. Richard, by birth, and the Sisters of the Dark, by contrivance. All of the Sisters of the Dark were now captives of Jagang, except for Nietzsche and four others. Three of Richard's former teachers from the Palace of the Prophets and their leader, Sister Ulyssia. Kronos shook his bloody fist at Nietzsche. The people of al Turang are traitors. They have defiled a holy place. In turning away from the ways of the Order, they have turned away from the Creator himself. Through our hands, the Creator will have his revenge and smite these sinful people. We will cleanse all to a wrong, not just of their flesh and bone, but of their unenlightened ways. The Imperial Order will once again rule all to a wrong, and from there, Jagang the Just will rule the world under the rightful ways of the Creator. Nietzsche almost laughed. Kronos had no idea that he was speaking to the person who had given Jagang the title of Jagang the Just. She had told the Emperor that such pronouncements of justice under his rule would win over a great number of people without having to fight them. He had been willing to battle them all. She alone had been able to make him see that it was to his benefit to have them rally to his side of their own free will. She told Jagang that the name she had given him would bring the people to him. She had been all too right. Many people equated intentions with the actual deed. The title she had given Jagang was now widely believed by people who didn't know much at all about him or the order. It never failed to amaze her how simply saying something, no matter how untrue, was all it took to convince a large number of people of what you wanted them to believe. She supposed that it was easier for them to let someone else do their thinking for them. Kronos's tirade had brought her time to recover. With her strength returning, Nietzsche couldn't afford to wait another instant. She straightened her arm, pointing her fist up toward him. She wanted to draw her force out the length of her arm to let it build and converge at a point just beyond her fist. While it wasn't at all necessary, she wanted to do it that way simply because it pleased her to let Kronos see her overt threat. Confident in his ability and the shields of his power, her hostile posture only served to further enrage him. How dare you threaten? She released a tight bolt of additive and subtractive magic laced together in a fearsome cord of destruction that arced through the wizard's shields like lightning through paper and blew a melon-sized hole right through the center of his chest. Cronus's eyes snapped wide, his mouth hung open in mute shock as his mind registered the irredeemable. Through that hole, Nietzsche could see the sky. Almost instantly, the internal pressure forced what remained of his surrounding organs into the void and then out the opening as Cronus's mortally wounded body toppled back. The man hadn't known that his power was no match for hers. 
he could only conjure shields of additive magic. Such shields were of limited use against subtractive magic. All around her, weapons were already being lifted. Powerful muscles drew bowstrings to cheeks. Arms with spears cocked back, the iron tips all pointing at her, along with swords, axes, and pikes. Without pause, Nietzsche unleashed a blast of opposing magic twined together in a shattering ignition that in ruinous fury leveled the officers' tents and blasted through the men on the knoll. The devastating concussion radiated outward in a circle at breathtaking speed, stripping flesh from bone. The ground was made muddy by the sudden deluge of blood. The heat that had been focused into the blast was so intense that nearby trees erupted in flame. The clothes of men in the surrounding camp who had been rushing to meet the threat also caught fire. The flesh of those a little closer ignited. Men closer yet were ripped apart by the thunderous discharge of Nietzsche's power. The force of what she had unleashed dissipated with distance, and men farther away were only sent sprawling. Such an extreme effort was risky because it was so draining but it had the desired effect. In an instant, the situation had changed from arrogant brutes gloating over a captive woman to confusion and panic. Fearing to lose the initiative, she focused intense heat into the trunks of trees along the creek bank behind the men. It was a method of getting a large return for a small investment of power. Superheated sap instantly boiled into steam and the massive cottonwood trunks exploded in thunderous blasts, sending heavy sections of splintered wood spiraling through the crowds of men, cutting them down by the dozens. Nietzsche swiftly conjured a liquid fire and sent the inferno spilling out across the field and into the confusion, igniting men, horses, and equipment in the terrible fury of roaring flames. The screams of man and beast melted together into one long, terrible cry. The air smelled of oily smoke as well as burning hair and flesh. At last, men were no longer charging in at her. In the brief break, Nietzsche struggled to get up from the blood-soaked ground. She stumbled through the carnage. Sadin raced forward through the thick haze and nudged her with his head, helping her to find her balance. She threw an arm over his neck, relieved that she had succeeded in directing her power around him and that he was all right. She finally seized the reins and, grunting with effort, managed to pull herself up on the horse before men could spear him or slash her or send arrows at them. She spun Sadin around, all the time casting boiling gouts of fire out among the men as they again began rushing in at her. As they caught on fire, they stumbled blindly, shrieking, flailing, crashing into other men or into tents, spreading the deadly conflagration. A man on one of the big war horses suddenly galloped out of the smoke. The soldier raised his sword as he screamed a battle cry. Before Nietzsche could do anything, Sadin bellowed in rage and snapped, ripping the war horse's ear off. The wounded horse screamed in terror and pain as it spun and bucked. The soldier was sent flying into the burning bodies. Nietzsche directed a web of power at men rushing in at her, each in turn, just for an instant, but long enough to stop their hearts. They stumbled, clutching their chests. In a way, it was more frightening for men to see their comrades gasp and drop from a mysterious cause than it was to see them rent by violence. From Nietzsche's point of view, it was just as effective, and it didn't take as much of her strength. Even though it required specific targeting, stopping a heart was easier than conjuring flames or lightning. With so many men all around her and all rushing in at her, she knew she was going to need all her strength if she hoped to get out of the camp alive. While the men in the immediate area knew what was happening, as of yet, those in the outlying areas of the camp weren't fully aware of what was specifically going on, although they now knew they were under some sort of attack. Being well-trained, they all rallied. From all directions, arrows zipped through the air, Spears began flying past. An arrow flicked through Nietzsche's hair. Another clipped her shoulder just enough to cut her. Nietzsche drummed her heels against Sadin's ribs and lay forward over his withers. 
she was astonished at the power with which the horse leaped away. He fearlessly galloped right through men rushing in at them. The stallion's hooves made a sickening sound as they struck bone. Men tumbled away. Sadin jumped over tents and fires. The air was alive with terrible screams. As she raced through the camp, Nietzsche took every opportunity to inflict yet more death and destruction. But from behind her, a swelling, angry roar began to lift from thousands upon thousands of men all the way across the valley. The power of it, the ferocity, was frightening. Nietzsche vividly recalled Richard's warning that all it would take was one lucky arrow. Now there were thousands. Nietzsche diverted her power from attacking to shielding her and her horse. As Sadin carried her back through the men, horses, wagons, and tents, Nietzsche let go of her defenses and again focused a scythe of her gift to slice through anything living that was close enough. The intensely concentrated and compacted edge of air sliced through men as they ran in to intercept her. As her horse leaped some obstacles and dodged others, that deadly edge of her power cut some men off at the knees and decapitated others. Horses screamed as their legs were cleaved from under them and they crashed to the ground. Shrieks of horror and pain from wounded men followed in her wake, but there were growing cries of rage. As she charged through the camp, Nietzsche could see men all around swiftly saddling their horses and mounting up. Spears and lances were snatched from those stacked everywhere throughout the encampment. Nietzsche wished she could destroy the weapons, but she had to concentrate just to hold on to Sadin as he bounded over anything in his way, including an occasional wagon. The horse seemed possessed to get her out of the danger as swiftly as possible. Even so, men in gathering numbers were taking up the chase, whether on horse or foot. As she cleared the last of the tents, Nietzsche looked back over her shoulder. The place was in an uproar. Flames still shot skyward. Billowing clouds of oily black smoke rose in several places. She didn't have any idea how many men she had killed, but there were thousands of them coming after her. The pounding she was taking atop a galloping horse was making her back hurt something fierce. At least she had eliminated Kronos. They had tried to trick her, but in the end it had cost them a second wizard that she hadn't even known they had with them and would have been terrible trouble for the defenders back in all Turang. It had turned out to be a bit of good fortune, as long as they didn't have three wizards. Chapter 28 As Nietzsche crested a hill, the first glimpse of the vast city in the distance was a beautiful sight. A quick glance over her shoulder revealed the thundering cavalry right on her heels. Nietzsche was able to see the raised swords, axes, spears, and lances glinting in the light of the setting sun like steel quills of an immense porcupine. The cloud of dust boiling up behind them blotted out the darkening eastern sky. The bloodthirsty battle cries were terrifying. And that was only the cavalry. She knew that farther back came the tide of foot soldiers. Even if the sun wouldn't have been in her eyes, Nietzsche didn't think that she could have spotted anyone in the city. That was as it should be. She wanted people, for the most part, to stay hidden. Even so, it was not reassuring to feel all alone with an angry hornet's nest chasing her. She had told Victor and Ishak the route she would try to take when returning so that they could concentrate their defenses to the best advantage. She hoped they were ready. There hadn't been a great deal of time to prepare. They would get no more, though. Time was up. With the city looming closer, Nietzsche at last spared the effort to snake her right arm through the sleeve of her dress, then reached back and threaded her left arm through the other sleeve. Holding the reins in one hand, leaning forward over the galloping horse's withers, she at last managed to blindly button her dress back up. She smiled at the small victory. The first small buildings flashed by. Although there had been a cutoff from the main road that would have more quickly gotten her into the confines of the city, Nietzsche had kept to the main road down out of the hills. Entering Altorang, the road turned into a broad boulevard. 
the main east-west thoroughfare. As the buildings grew closer together, they also rose up higher. In places along the road, trees lined the way. She could see, fastened on the bark of those trees, the split open empty skins of cicadas that had molted. It gave Nietzsche a fleeting memory of lying in the shelter in the warmth of Richard's arm. Sardine was sweating into a lather, and she knew that he had to be tiring, but he didn't show any sign of wanting to slow. She had to urge him to ease up just a little anyway so that the cavalry would get closer to her. She wanted them to believe they were catching her. Once a predator chasing prey was closing in, they tended to lose sight of everything else. The instinct to chase was as strong in soldiers as it was in wolves. Nietzsche wanted them to throw caution to the wind as they ran her down, so she leaned a little to the side, making it look as if she might be wounded and ready to fall. Running down the center of the road, trailing a ribbon of dust, she began to recognize groups of buildings. She remembered patterns of windows. She saw a butter-colored clabbered building to the left and red shutters to the right that she recognized. In the shadows down an alleyway just beyond a row of closely packed buildings that she knew were homes because of the laundry hanging on lines between them, she spotted some of the men hiding. They all had bows. She knew she wasn't far. She suddenly came upon the three-story brick building. In the late light, she almost didn't recognize it. The spikes lying across the road were covered with a thin layer of dirt to hide them from the soldiers. As she galloped past, she spotted men hiding just around the corner, ready to pull up the spikes once she was by. Wait until most are past, she called out to the waiting men, just loud enough for them to hear, but not so loud that those following could hear. She saw one of them nod to her. She hoped they understood. If the spikes were pulled up at the head of the cavalry, bottlenecking them all, then only those in the lead would be taken out, and most of those in the rear would escape injury and regroup. If that happened, then they would have lost their chance to break up the cavalry. Nietzsche needed the defenders manning the spikes to allow most to get past. Nietzsche looked back over her shoulder to see the big men with their weapons raised thundering past the brick building. Most cleared the rear of the building, but then there was a sudden howling boom as charging war horses crashed headlong into the iron spikes. Horses behind weren't able to stop and violently collided with the animals that had been impaled. Riders cried out as they were crushed. Other men tumbled over the heads of their horses. From the windows, arrows rained down as soldiers now on foot tried to halt the tail of the cavalry still charging in. Men desperately slowed their mounts. As they did, they were hit with arrows. Men and horses were hit with a withering flight of arrows from several directions. Most of the men put an arm up only to then realize that they had neglected to take the time to get their shields. As the last of the riders were still crashing into the sudden blockade, Nietzsche went right at the fork in the wide road. The cavalry was right on her heels and swept down the street after her. Wait until half are past, she yelled at the men hiding around the corner of a tall stone wall as she raced past. Again came the hard impacts and terrible noise of animals screaming in pain and terror as they were unexpectedly impaled or torn open. Soldiers cried out as they were violently unhorsed. Men carrying spears rushed out from behind the building, running the soldiers through before they had a chance to get to their feet and fight. Axes, swords, and flails belonging to fallen soldiers were swept up by men to be used against the order. Some of the cavalry, fooled a second time, didn't intend to be fooled again, and at a full gallop peeled off from the main column, some taking another street to the left. Others turned down a narrow road to the right. The riders following her had gone hardly any distance at all and had not had a chance to fully consider if they should break off the charge when Nietzsche cleared the third barrier of iron spikes as men yanked them up and jammed posts in place. The horses just behind her crashed into the spikes. From immediately behind came the most terrible noise of the immense weight of horse flesh thudding into the lead animals already caught up on the iron spikes and stopped cold in their tracks. 
A great cry lifted from the cavalrymen as they were ensnared in the violent debacle. Almost at the same time, the riders who had taken roads to the right and left suddenly found themselves caught up in the same iron traps. The enemy found themselves in a box canyon of brick and iron rather than rock. The impact of the horses running at full speed, clouting into a tangled pile of broken men and animals blocking the main road was ghastly. Flesh pounded against flesh and bones snapped. Horses screamed in pain. So powerful was the force of the impact that it broke the spike wall and blew a hole through the bottleneck of carcasses. Great war horses, some with their face armor and some without, spilled through the gap, slipping and sliding on the blood and gore of slain comrades and other animals. In the treacherous footing, some of the horses and riders fell. Others, pouring through the gap at a full gallop, didn't have anywhere else to go and trampled them. Men bristling with spears rushed out of alleyways to the sides and into the path of the charging cavalry to close the breach in the line. The horses, already in shock from the carnage and terrible destruction of so many of their kind, now faced rank upon rank of men running in at them, yelling battle cries, thrusting spears into their sides. The animals squealed with horrific, desperate screams as they were mercilessly gored. The fallen animals tripped up those still running in an attempt to escape. The evening air sounded as if it were ripping, as archers rained down a hail of arrows on cavalrymen struggling to escape the carnage. Nietzsche doubted that these Imperial Order troops would have deliberately attacked into the city, using the cavalry in such a fashion, if they had not been goaded into it. These kind of horses were not meant for this kind of fighting. They simply couldn't maneuver properly in the close quarters, and the cavalrymen couldn't effectively cut down their opposition. To make matters more difficult for them, the defenders had too many places to hide for a cavalry charge to be truly effective. The purpose of the cavalry would have been to swiftly crush any organized resistance out in the open, hoping to stop the order before they reached the city, and then to run down anyone who tried to escape the city after the troops were sent in. Had the commanders been properly in control of the situation and their men, Nietzsche doubted they would have allowed such a crazy cavalry charge into the confines of a city. Nietzsche, of course, had known all that when she went to whack the hornet's nest. The folly of a cavalry attack into a city was becoming all too apparent. The killing was as swift as it was brutal. The gruesome sight of so many horses and men torn open seemed somehow unreal. The stench of blood was gagging. When she saw a column of the enemy turn down an alleyway to make an escape, Nietzsche cast her Han outward, using a concentrated spike of force to snap the bones of the lead horse. As the animal's legs folded under it, the horses following crashed into it at full speed, breaking their legs as the first horse rolled under them before they were able to leap out of the way. A few of the horses following behind, seeing what was happening and having more time to react, were able to jump clear. Nietzsche saw the men at the far end of the narrow alleyway close off their escape route. Nietzsche cut around the corner to reach the main bottleneck and help prevent any Imperial Order cavalry from escaping the trap. As she rounded the final building, she encountered a knot of cavalry as they broke through the lines of men with spears. Nietzsche sent a molten ball of flame howling toward the enemy. It cleared the heads of the defenders and hit the street, splashing liquid fire across the horses' flanks. The animals, their hides ablaze, reared up, allowing the flames to roll up onto the men on their backs. Nietzsche raced around tightly packed buildings to come up behind the tail end of the center trap that had ensnared a large number of the enemy. The men of the city had already set upon them. For once, the cavalrymen were outnumbered, disorganized, and unable to break free of the onslaught. Men fighting for their freedom had a burning determination that the soldiers had not expected to encounter. Their tactics of intimidation and simple slaughter had fallen apart. In the fading light of dusk, Nietzsche spotted Victor swinging a heavy mace at any Imperial Order head he could find. She urged Sardine through the slaughter. Victor! The man looked up with a murderous scowl. What? He cried out over the din of the battle, blood dripping from the steel blades of his weapon. 
Nietzsche stepped her horse closer. The soldiers are coming right behind the cavalry. They will be the real test. We don't dare let them change their mind about attacking now. Just in case they are having any second thoughts, I'm going to go give them something irresistible to chase into the city. Victor flashed her a grim grin. Good. We will be ready for them. Once the army poured into Altorong, there was no way they would be able to stay together. They would split up to move down different streets. Once they did that, each of those groups could be further divided by the defenders. As each group fled or charged, they would face hidden archers and groups of men with spears, to say nothing of the numerous traps. Altorong was huge. As darkness took the city, many of the invaders would become disoriented and lost. Because of the narrow warren of streets, they wouldn't be able to stay together to present a coordinated attack. They would not be allowed to go where they wished, as they wished, attacking helpless people. They would be relentlessly pursued and harried. Each group would get smaller all the time, both because they would be whittled down while under constant attack and because some of their men would try other routes to find a way to safety. Nietzsche had made sure that there was no place of safety in the city. There is blood all down the front of you, Victor called up to her. Are you all right? I got clumsy and fell off my horse. I'm fine. This must end tonight, she reminded Victor. In a hurry to go after Richard? She smiled, but didn't answer his question. I'd better go whack the hornet's nest. I will bring them on my heels. He nodded. We're ready. When she spotted three soldiers in the distance trying to make an escape without their horses, Nietzsche paused to cast a shimmering spell down a narrow twisting street. With three rapid thuds, the lance of power slammed through flesh and bone to drop the three. And Victor, she said, turning back to the man, there's one last thing. What would that be? No one gets away alive. No one. With the sounds of battle raging behind him, he appraised her eyes for a moment. I understand. Ishak will be waiting for you. Try to get the hornet's nest there as quickly as you can. Nietzsche, checking the reins to hold Sardine in place, nodded. I will bring the soldiers right down. She turned to the sudden whoosh of flame. Great gouts of fire flared up in the east. She knew that it could mean only one thing. Victor cursed and climbed up to stand on the carcass of a dead war horse as he craned his neck, trying to get a view over the rooftops at the thick smoke billowing up into the darkening sky. He cast a suspicious scowl at Nietzsche. You failed to get Kronos? I got Kronos, she growled through gritted teeth, and another wizard. It would appear that they have another gifted with them. I guess they came prepared. Nietzsche laid the reins over, turning Sardin toward the distant sound of screams. But they didn't come prepared for death's mistress. Chapter 29 What do you think it could mean? Berdine asked. Verna glanced over at the moored Sith's blue eyes. Anne didn't say. The library was dead quiet, but for the soft hiss of oil lamps. What with the row upon row of aisles, along with the woodwork and shelves of dark walnut, the lamps and candles did little to illuminate the vast inner sanctuary. Had Verna lit all the reflector lamps lining the walls and hung on the end caps of shelves, the place could have been made to be considerably brighter, but for their purpose, she didn't think it necessary. In a way, Verna felt that if they were to light too many lamps, pull out too many ancient volumes, disturb the sanctum to a large degree, it might wake the ghosts of all the master Rawls who haunted the place. Heavy beams divided the dark frame and panel woodwork of deep-set ceiling coves. Gilded carvings of vines and leaves meandered up columns to the side that supported those massive timbers. Strange yet beautiful symbols were painted in rich colors across the faces of the beams. Underfoot were spread luxurious carpets woven with elaborate designs in muted colors. And everywhere, around the outer walls, in cases, behind glassed doors, and in freestanding shelves marching through the library in orderly row upon row, 
were books by the thousands. Their leather bindings, mostly in deep colors with at least some gold or silver leaf on the spines, added a rich mottled texture to the place. Verna had rarely seen libraries so grand. The vaults at the Palace of the Prophets, where she had spent a great deal of time in study, had also held thousands of books, but the place had been utilitarian, serving only the function of storing books and providing a practical place to read them. The palace revealed a reverence for the books and the knowledge they contained. Knowledge was power and throughout the ages each Lord Rahl in turn had such power at his fingertips. Whether or not he used that knowledge wisely was another question. The only problem with such vast amounts of information would be accessing a specific item, or even knowing that it existed in such an immense collection. Of course, in times long past, there would have been scribes who, besides their work of making copies of important works, attended the libraries and were responsible for specific sections. The master could then easily ask a few relevant questions, narrowing the search to the individual dedicated to the particular area of interest and be pointed in the right direction. Now, without such specialists tending the libraries, the priceless information contained in the countless volumes was considerably more difficult to retrieve. In a way, the magnitude of information became a hindrance to its own purpose, and, like a soldier carrying so many weapons he couldn't move, nearly useless. The books held in this one library alone represented almost an unimaginable amount of work by countless scholars and a great many prophets. A short stroll through the aisles had revealed works here on history, geography, politics, the natural world, and prophecy, that Verna had never seen before. A person could spend a lifetime lost in the place, and yet Berdine had said that the People's Palace had a number of such libraries, from some that a variety of people were allowed to visit, to some that no one but the Lord Rahl, and Verna assumed his most trusted confidants, could enter. This library was one of the latter. Berdine had said that because she knew High de Haran, Dark and Rahl had sometimes brought her into the most private of the libraries to get her opinion on translations of obscure passages in ancient texts. As a result, Berdine was in a unique position to know at least something about the wealth of potentially hazardous knowledge stored in the palace. Not all prophecy was equally troublesome, though. A lot of it turned out to be incidental and rather harmless. What most people didn't realize was that a lot of prophetic space was taken up with what amounted to little more than the stuff of gossip. But by no means was all prophecy so congenial or frivolous, and wandering through the titillating trivia of everyday lives tended to lull one into complacency, and then when you least expected it, dark things came out of the pages to snatch at your soul. While there were volumes that were by and large completely harmless, there were others that were, for anyone but the untrained, unsafe from the first words to the last. This particular library held some of the most dangerous books of prophecy Verna knew of, books that at the Palace of the Prophets were considered so volatile that they were not kept in the main vault, but in smaller, heavily shielded vaults restricted to all but a handful of people at the palace. The presence of those books was probably the reason why this particular library was a very private retreat for Master Rawl alone. Verna seriously doubted that the guards would have allowed her in had a moored Sith not been escorting her. Verna could happily spend a great deal of time in such a cozy place exploring countless books she had never seen before. Unfortunately, she didn't have the luxury of time she idly wondered if Richard had ever even seen what was now his as the Lord Rahl. Berdine tapped a finger to the blank page in the Glendhill Book of Deviation Theory. I'm telling you, Prelate, I studied this book with Lord Rahl at the Wizard's Keep in Aidendril. So you said. Verna found it interesting, to say the least, that Richard knew of the Glendhill Book of Deviation Theory. She found it even more curious, considering his distaste for prophecy and the fact that this book of prophecies was mostly about him, that he'd studied it. 
There seemed no end to the curious little things that from time to time Verna discovered about Richard. Part of his dislike for prophecy, she knew, was his aversion to riddles. He hated them. She also knew, though, that in large measure, his animus toward prophecy was due to his belief in free will, his belief that he himself, and not the hand of destiny, made his own life what it was. While enormously complex, and with layers of meaning beyond most people's comprehension, prophecy certainly did revolve around core elements of the preordained in its nature. And yet Richard had more than once fulfilled prophecy while at the same time proving it wrong. Verna sourly suspected that, in a perverse way, prophecy had foretold of Richard's birth just so that he could come into the world to prove the concept of prophecy invalid. Richard's actions had never been easy to predict, even, or perhaps especially, for prophecy. In the beginning, Verna had been baffled by the things he would do and was perpetually unable to predict how he would react to situations or what he might do next. She had come to learn, though, that what she had thought was his confounding switching in a blink from one matter to something completely unrelated was, simply at its core, his singular consistency. Most people were not able to remain riveted to a goal with such dedicated determination. They tended to become distracted by a variety of other urgent matters requiring their attention. Richard, as if in a sword fight with a number of opponents at once, prioritized those ancillary events, holding them in abeyance or dispatching them as need be, while always keeping his goal firmly fixed in his mind. It sometimes gave people the false impression that he was skipping from one unrelated thing to another, when in reality he was, to him, innocently dancing across rocks in the river of events around him as he worked his way steadily toward the opposite bank. At times, he was the most wonderful man Verna had ever met, at other times, the most exasperating. She'd long ago lost track of how often she had wanted to strangle him. Besides being the man born to lead them in the final battle, he had, by force of his own will, become their leader, the Lord Rahl, the linchpin of everything she had struggled for as a sister of the light, just as prophecy foretold. But not at all in the manner it had so carefully laid out. Perhaps more than anything else he meant to them all, Verna valued Richard as a friend. She ached for him to be happy, the way she had once been happy with Warren. Her time with Warren after they were married and before he had been killed had been the most alive she had ever felt. Since then, she felt like the living dead, alive, but not part of life. Age 287. Verna hoped that someday, maybe when they finally won the struggle against the Order, that Richard could find someone to love. He loved life so much, he needed someone to share that with. She smiled inwardly. From the first day she had met him and put the collar around his neck to take him back to the Palace of the Prophets to be trained to use his gift, her life had felt as if it had been caught up in the whirlpool that was Richard. She vividly remembered that snowy day back at the Mud People's Village when she had taken him away. It had been profoundly sad because it had been against his will, and at the same time, it had been a momentous relief after having searched for him for twenty years. To be sure, he had not gone willingly into such benevolent captivity. In fact, two of the sisters with Verna had died in the effort to make Richard put on that collar he so hated. Verna frowned. Put on the collar. That was odd. She tried to recall exactly how it was that she had managed to get him to put the collar around his neck, as it had to be done. Richard hated collars, especially after having once been a captive of a moored Sith, and yet he had put it on of his own free will. For some peculiar reason, though, she couldn't seem to recall just how she had managed to get him to. Verna, this is really strange. The brown leather of Berdine's outfit creaked 
as she leaned in a little more, peering intently at the last of the text in the ancient volume laid open on the table before her. She carefully turned a page, checking, and then turned it back. She looked up. I know this book had writing in it before. That writing is now missing. As Verna watched the candlelight dance in Berdine's blue eyes, she set aside memories from long ago and returned her full attention to the important matters at hand. But it wasn't this book now, was it? When Berdine frowned, Verna went on to explain. It may have been the same title, but it wasn't this very book. You were at the keep. It was a different copy of this book, yes? Well, sure, I guess you're right that it wasn't this actual book. Berdine straightened and scratched her head of wavy brown hair. But if it's the same title, then why do you think that the copy at the wizard's keep has all the writing in it while this one has big sections of the writing missing? I didn't say that the copy there still has all the writing in it. I'm only saying that the copy at the keep, not this one, was the one you studied with Richard. That you recall reading it and not seeing any blank pages doesn't prove anything because it wasn't this very same book. But even more importantly, this book might in fact be identical in that it contains all the same text, but the scribe who made this duplicate might have simply left blank pages among that text for any number of reasons. Berdine looked skeptical. What reasons? Verna shrugged. Sometimes books with incomplete prophecies such as these here have blank places left in them to provide room for future prophets to finish the prophecy. Berdine planted her fists on her hips. Fine, but answer me one question. When I look through this book, I recall the things I'm reading. I may not understand most of it, but I remember it in a general sense. Remember reading these passages. So why is it that I can't remember a single thing about the sections that are missing from the book? The simple explanation is that you don't recall anything of the blank sections because they are simply that, blank places, as I said, that were left in the book by the person who made the copy. No, that's not what I mean. I mean, I recall the general nature of the prophecies, the length of them. As a gifted person, you would be more attuned to what you're reading. I wouldn't. Since I never really understood these prophecies, I instead remember more of the way they looked. I remember how long they were. These are no longer complete. I didn't understand them, and I remember how long they seemed and how hard it was to make sense of such long prophecies. When something is hard to understand, it always seems longer than it really is. No, Verdine screwed up her face with conviction. That's not it. She turned to the last prophecy and tapped the page. This one here is only a page long, followed by a number of blank pages. I can't say that I remember the others so well, but for some reason I paid more attention to the last one. I'm telling you, I remember that this one for sure was a lot longer. I can't swear to how long the others were, or how long this one is supposed to be, but I do know for certain that this last one, at least, was more than a page. It wasn't complete, as this one here is now. No matter how hard I try, I can't seem to remember how long it was or what it said, but I know that it was more than a single page. That was the confirmation Verna had been waiting for. While most of it makes little sense to me, Berdine went on, I do remember this part, this beginning having to do with all the talk about a forked source and the confusing business about going back to a mantic root and then the splitting the horde that vaunts the creator's cause. That part at least sounds like the imperial order, but I can't recall the rest of it that's blank after a leader's lost thrust. I'm not imagining it, Verna, I'm not. I can't say why I'm so sure that the rest of it is missing, but I am. And therein lies what has me so bothered. Why is the part that's missing from the book missing from my memory? Verna leaned close and lifted an eyebrow. Now that, my dear, is the question that I find troubling. Berdine looked startled. You mean you know what I'm talking about? You believe me? Verna nodded. I'm afraid so. 
I didn't want to plant the seed of suggestion in your mind. I wanted you to confirm my own suspicions. Then this is what Anne was concerned about, what she wanted us to check? It is. Verna shuffled through the disorderly jumble of books on the sturdy table, finally pulling out the one she wanted. Look here at this book. This is the one that is perhaps the most troubling to me. Collected Origins is an exceedingly rare prophecy in that it was written entirely in story form. I studied this book before I left the Palace of the Prophets to search for Richard. I practically knew the story by heart. Verna fanned through the pages. The book is now entirely blank, and I can't remember a single thing about it except that it had something to do with Richard. Exactly what? I have no idea. Berdine studied Verna's eyes the way only a moored Sith could study someone's eyes. So this is some kind of trouble, and that trouble is a threat to Lord Rahl. Verna let out a deep breath. The flames of several of the closer candles fluttered as she did so. I'd be lying if I said otherwise, Berdine. While the missing text doesn't all have to do with Richard, it all pertains to a time after his birth. I don't have a clue as to the nature of the problem, but I admit that it has me greatly concerned. Verdine's demeanor changed. Usually the woman was the most good-natured of any of the moored Sith that Verna knew. Verdine had a kind of simple childlike glee about the world around her. At times she could be heartwarmingly curious. Despite hardships that had others complaining, Verdine usually wore an unaffected smile. But at the impression of some kind of threat to Richard, she changed in a flash to all business. And now she had turned as suspicious and coldly menacing as any moored Sith ever was. What could be the cause of this? Verdine demanded. What does it mean? Verna closed the book full of blank pages. I don't know, Verdine. I really don't. Anne and Nathan are as puzzled as we are. And Nathan is a prophet. What does that part about people losing trust in their leader mean? For an ungifted person, Berdine had managed to single out the most crucial part of a very oblique prophecy. Well, Verna said, cautiously framing her answer, it could mean a number of things. It's hard to tell. Maybe hard for me, but not hard for you. Verna cleared her throat. I'm not an expert in prophecy, you understand, but I think it has something to do with Richard. I know that much. Why would this prophecy talk about people losing trust in him? Berdine, prophecy is rarely as straightforward as it seems. Verna wished the woman would stop staring at her. What it seems to say usually has nothing at all to do with the actual event involved in the body of the prophecy. Prelate, this prophecy seems to me to suggest that questions of soundness of mind are going to be the cause of a leader's lost thrust. Since this prophecy names the leader as the one opposed to the horde that vaunts the Creator's cause, that would be the Imperial Order, that means it has to be talking about Lord Raal. It then follows that Lord Raal is the leader in whom people will lose thrust. It comes after the part about the splitting of the horde, which the Order has now done. That makes the threat imminent. Verna felt sorry for anyone who ever made the unfortunate mistake of underestimating Verdine. It is my experience that prophecy sometimes tends to fret over Richard like a doting grandparent. This sounds to me like a specific threat. Verna folded her hands before herself. Verdine, you are a very smart woman. So I hope you can understand why it would be a grave mistake for me to argue or even discuss this prophecy with you. Prophecy is beyond the mind of the ungifted. It has little to do with how smart a person is. Prophecy is a creation of the gifted and meant only for those who are gifted in the same way. They are not even intended for other types of wizards. Even us sisters, talented sorceresses though we may be, had to train for years before we were allowed to even look at prophecy, much less work with it. It is exceedingly dangerous for the untrained to hazard guesses at the meaning of prophecy. You may recognize the words, but you do not recognize the meaning of those words. 
That's silly. Words are words. They have meaning. That is how we can understand the world around us. Why would prophecy take words that mean something and use them for some other unknown meaning? Verna felt as if she were stepping gingerly through a field of bear traps. That isn't exactly what I meant by what I said. Words can be used to make people understand, to explain, to veil, and to interpret the world. But they can also be used to explain things that are only speculation. If I foretell that dark times will come into your life, those words may be true. But it could mean that you will suffer a loss that will sadden you. Or it could mean that you will be murdered. Though the words might be true, their exact meaning is not yet known. It would be a grave injustice to use those words as a reason to start killing everyone around you because the words made you fear you would be murdered. Wars have started over such misunderstandings about prophecy. People have died as the result of the untrained hearing what they think are the simple words of prophecy. That is why the books of prophecy were kept in secure vaults below the palace of the prophets. These books of prophecy are not kept in vaults. Verna's brow drew down as she leaned toward the moored Sith. Perhaps they should be. Are you saying that I'm wrong in what I believe this prophecy says? Verna heaved another sigh. Right or wrong is impossible to discern in this instance. We can't even begin to intelligently dissect this prophecy because it's incomplete. We have here only the beginning of it and then a number of blank pages. So? So it could be just as you say that it's about Richard and people will question his judgment and lose faith in him. But maybe the missing text says that the issue will be resolved the next day by some other event of consequence, and they will think more of him than they ever had before. Not only can prophecy be forked, meaning that it may be an either-or kind of statement, but the same prophecy could mean opposite things. I don't see how it can mean opposite things. And how could something happen in the missing text of this prophecy to change people's minds? Verna shrugged as she gazed around the vast, dimly lit library, trying to think of an example. Well, say that they thought his battle plan was crazy. Maybe the army officers think it ill-advised. That could be something that would result in this prophecy, in people losing faith in him. Then say that despite the advice of officers, Richard insists, and so, despite their doubts and lack of faith, the soldiers follow his plan as ordered and achieve a victory that they never thought they could win. Their faith in Richard as their leader would be restored, and they would probably have even more respect for his judgment than they ever did before. But if the prophecy were to be acted upon without understanding its true meaning, those actions very well could countermand the rest of the event, as it would have taken place naturally, and give the illusion that the prophecy had been fulfilled, but in fact, the real and truly prophesied events had been bypassed by foolishly invoking a misinterpretation of the actual prophecy. Berdine, watching Verna the whole time, drew her single brown braid through a loose fist. I guess that could make sense. You see, Berdine, why prophecy is so confusing even for those of us trained in it? But to make matters worse, without the whole prophecy, we dare not even begin to try to understand them or to assign any significance to them. The complete text is indispensable if one is to even begin to try to understand prophecy. Without all the text, it's as if prophecy has gone blind. That's one reason why this is so disturbing. One reason? Berdine looked up again, still running her braid through her fist. What is the other reason? It's bad enough to be without the text that was previously there, but the cause behind such an unprecedented event, the text of prophecy vanishing, is troubling in the extreme. I thought you just said that we shouldn't jump to conclusions when it comes to prophecy. Verna cleared her throat, feeling as if one of those bear traps just snapped closed on her leg. Well, that's true, but it's obvious that something is going on. Berdine folded her arms as she pondered the question. What do you think could be happening? Verna shook her head. I can't begin to imagine. Such a thing, to my knowledge, has never happened before. 
I have no idea why it's happening now. But you think it's trouble that involves Lord Ra? Verna gave Berdeen a sidelong look. The simple fact that so much of prophecy involves him makes that conclusion impossible to avoid. Richard is born to trouble. He is at the center of it. Berdeen didn't appear to like that one bit. That is why he needs us. I've never argued that he didn't. Berdeen relaxed, if only a notch, and flicked her braid back over her shoulder. No, you have not. Anne is searching for him. Let's hope she can find him, and soon. We need him to lead us in the coming battle. As Verna spoke, Berdeen idly pulled a book from one of the glass cases and began leafing through it. Lord Rall is supposed to be magic against magic, not the steel against steel. That is a Daharan proverb. Prophecy says that he must lead us in the final battle. I suppose, Berdine mumbled without looking up as she slowly turned pages. With part of Jagang's forces headed south around the mountains, we can only hope that Anne will find him in time and bring him to us. Berdine was puzzling at the book. What is it that is buried with the bones? What? Berdine was still frowning as she tried to work out something in the book. This book caught my attention before because it says Fuer Grisa Ost Drauka on the cover. That's Haidaharan. It means the bringer of death. Berdine glanced up. Yes, how did you know? There was a widely known prophecy that the sisters back at the palace of the prophets used to debate. It had actually been hotly debated for centuries. The first day I brought Richard to the palace, he declared himself to be the bringer of death and thus named himself to be the one in the prophecy. It caused quite a stir among the sisters, I can tell you. One day down in the vaults, Warren showed Richard the prophecy and Richard himself solved the riddle of it, although to Richard it wasn't a riddle. He understood it because he had lived portions of the prophecy. This book has a lot of blank pages in it. No doubt. It sounds like it's about Richard. There are probably a great number of books here that are about him. Berdine was reading again. This is in Haidaharan. Like I said, I know Haidaharan. I would have to work at it to be able to translate it more completely. And it would help if there wasn't so much missing text. But this place is apparently talking about Lord Rao. It says something like, what he seeks is buried with the bones. Or maybe even what he seeks is buried the bones, something like that. Berdeen looked up at Verna. Any idea what that's about? What it could mean? What he seeks is buried bones. Verna shook her head with regret. I have no idea. There are probably countless volumes here that have interesting or puzzling or frightening things to say about Richard. As I told you, though, with copy missing, what is there is next to useless. I suppose, Berdine said in disappointment. What about central sites? Central sites? Yes, this book mentions places called central sites. Berdine stared off as she considered something to herself. Central sites? Colo mentioned something about central sites. Colo? Berdine nodded. It's a journal written ages ago, during the Great War. Lord Rao found the book at the Wizard's Keep, in the room with the sliff. The man who kept the journal is named Koloblesin. In Haidaharan, the name means strong advisor. Lord Rao and I call him Kolo for short. What did this Kolo have to say about these places, these central sites? What are they? Berdine turned through the pages of the book she held. I don't recall. It was nothing I understood at the time, so I didn't devote a lot of effort to it. I'd have to go study it again to refresh my memory. She squinted in recollection. It seemed like there was something buried at the places called central sites. I can't remember if it said what was buried. The moored Sith stood frozen in her same pose as she studied the little book. I was hoping this might give me a clue. 
Verna let out a heavy sigh as she glanced around at the library. Berdine, I would love to stay and spend time researching all these books. I would truly like to know what this library and the others here at the palace contain. But there are more pressing matters at hand. We need to get back to the army and my sisters. Verna took a last look around. Before I go, however, there is one thing here at the People's Palace that I would like to check on. Maybe you can help me. Berdine reluctantly closed the book and replaced it on the shelf. She carefully closed the glass door. All right, prelate, what is it you want to see? Chapter 30 Verna paused at hearing the single long peal of a bell. What was that? Devotion, Berdine said, stopping to look back at Verna as the deep toll reverberated through the vast marble and granite halls of the People's Palace. People, no matter where they seemed to be headed, turned and instead moved toward the broad passageway from where the deep resonant sound of the bell had come. No one looked to be in a hurry, but they all very deliberately walked toward the slowly dying sound of the bell. Verna puzzled at Berdine. What? Devotion. You know what a devotion is. You mean a devotion to the Lord Rahl. That devotion? Berdine nodded. The bell announces that it is time for the devotion. Pensively, she gazed off in the direction of the hall where people were headed. Many of the gathering crowd were dressed in robes of a variety of muted colors. Verna assumed that white robes with gold or silver banding on them were the mark of officials of one sort or another who lived and worked at the palace. They certainly had the manner and bearing of officials. Everyone from those administrators to messengers in tunics trimmed in green and carrying leather satchels with an ornate letter R on them, standing for the House of Rawl, continued their casual conversations even as they made their way to the convergence of wide halls. Other people who worked at any of the countless variety of shops were dressed more appropriately for their profession, whether it was working at leather, silver, pottery, cobbling, or tailoring, providing the many foods and services, or doing any of the various palace work from maintenance to cleaning. There were a number of people dressed in the simple clothes of farmers, tradesmen, and merchants, many with their wives and some with children. Like those Verna had seen in the lower levels within the great plateau atop which sat the people's palace, or at the market set up outside, they appeared to be visitors come to trade or make purchases. Others, though, were dressed in finery for their sojourn to the palace. From what Verna had learned from Berdine, there were rooms that guests could rent if they wished to stay for an extended period. There were, as well, quarters for the many people who lived and worked at the palace. Most of the people in robes walked calmly, as if this were just another part of their day. Those dressed in finery tried to look just as calm and not stare at the exquisite architecture of the palace, but Verna saw their wide eyes wandering. The simply dressed visitors, as they fell in with the flow of all the people making their way toward the fork that would take them to the passageway with the bell, openly peered about at everything, at the towering statues of men and women in proud poses carved from variegated stone, at polished two-story fluted columns soaring past balconies, at the spectacular black granite and honey onyx floors. Verna knew that such intricate and precise patterns in the stone floors, set with such tight grout joints, could have been created only by the most talented master craftsmen in all of the New World. Serving as prelate at the Palace of the Prophets for a time, she had had to deal with the matter of the replacement of a section of beautifully patterned floor that had in the dim past been damaged by young wizards in training. The precise events leading to the damage and who exactly had been the guilty party remained shrouded in oaths not to tattle, but the result was that the bit of mischievous magic had in an instant torn up a long section of exquisitely laid marble floor. While the debris and loose tiles had long since been removed, the floor sat damaged for decades, filled in with serviceable but unsightly limestone, while life at the Palace of the Prophets moved on. 
the palace attitude toward the boys had been one of indulgence, in part out of a sense of regret for having to hold such young men against their will. Verna had always been vexed that the damage had never been fixed, in part because by not fixing it, it represented to her an attitude that had indulged such bad behavior. It had always seemed like she was the only one, except maybe until Richard came along, who was bothered by seeing such beauty marred. Richard expected the boys there to take responsibility for their actions. Even though he was held against his will, he never tolerated such senseless, destructive behavior. Warren saw matters the same way as Richard. Perhaps that was part of the reason they had become such fast friends. Warren had always been serious and dedicated about everything. After Richard had left the palace, Warren had reminded Verna that as the new prelate, she no longer needed to complain about either the behavior or the floor. He encouraged her to act on her convictions. So, as prelate, she both set new rules and set about seeing to the completion of the repairs to the floor. That was when she had come to learn a thing or two about such floors, and that while there were any number of men who boldly professed to be master craftsmen, very few actually were. Those who were let their work make clear the distinction. The former made the task a nightmare, the latter a joy. She remembered how proud Warren had been of her for seeing the task through and for not accepting anything less than the best. She missed him so much. Verna gazed around at the spectacular palace, at the intricate stonework, and yet such beauty now failed to move her. Since Warren had died, everything seemed bland, uninteresting, and unimportant to her. Since Warren had died, life itself seemed drudgery. Everywhere through the palace, wary soldiers patrolled, probably not even realizing or even considering the staggering amount of human imagination, skill, and effort that had gone into the creation of such a place as the People's Palace. Now they were a part of it, a part of what kept it viable, like thousands of men just like them who for centuries had walked these same halls and kept them safe. Verna noticed that some of the guards moved through the halls in pairs, while others patrolled in larger groups. The muscular young men were dressed in smart uniforms with molded leather shoulder and breastplates, and all carried at least a sword. Many of the soldiers also carried pikes with gleaming metal points. Verna noticed special guards who wore black gloves and carried crossbows slung over their shoulders. The quivers at their belts held red-fletched bolts. The soldiers' eyes were always on the move, watching everything. I seem to recall Richard mentioning the devotion, Verna said, but I didn't think that they still did it when the Lord Rawl wasn't at the palace, and especially not since Richard became the Lord Rawl. Verna hadn't exactly meant it to be condescending, although she realized after she'd said it that it must have sounded that way. It was just that Richard was, well, Richard. Berdine glanced at Verna askance. He is still the Lord Rawl. We are no less bonded to him because he is away. The devotion is always done at the palace whether the Lord Rawl is here or not. And regardless of how you may view him, he is the Lord Rawl by every measure. We have never had a Lord Rawl we respected as much as we respect him. That makes the devotion more meaningful and more important than it ever was before. Verna kept her mouth shut, but she cast Berdine a look that came all too easily to her as a sister of the light and now as prelate. Even though she understood the reasons behind it, she was the prelate of the sisters of the light, devoted to seeing the Creator's will done. As a sister of the light, living at the palace of the prophets under the spell that slowed their aging, she had seen rulers come and go. The sisters of the light never bowed down to any of them. She reminded herself that the palace of the prophets was gone. The imperial order now controlled many of the sisters. Berdine lifted an arm indicating the palace around them. The Lord Rall makes all this possible. He gives us a homeland. He is the magic against magic. His rule keeps us safe. 
While in the past we have had masters who regarded the devotion as a demonstration of servitude, its origin is actually nothing more than an act of respect. Verna's aggravation seethed just below the surface. This was not some mythic leader Berdeen was talking about, some wise old king. It was Richard. As much as Verna respected and valued him, it was still Richard. Woods guide Richard. Swiftly on the heels of her flash of indignation came regret for such unkind thoughts. Richard always fought for what was right. He had valiantly put his life in peril for his noble beliefs. He was also the one named in prophecy. He was also the seeker. He was also the Lord Rall, the bringer of death, who had turned the world upside down. Because of Richard, Verna was prelate. She wasn't sure if that was a blessing or a curse. Richard was also their last hope. Well, if he doesn't hurry up and join up with us to lead the Daharan army in the final battle, there will be none of us left to respect him. Berdeen withdrew her reproachful stare and unexpectedly started toward the passageway that turned off to the left, the one where the bell had rung. We are the steel against steel. Lord Rall is the magic against magic. If he doesn't come to fight with the army, it is only because of his duty to protect us from the dark forces of magic. Simple-minded gibberish, Verna muttered to herself as she hurried to catch up with the moored Sith. Where are you going? she called after the woman. To devotion. At the palace, everyone goes to devotion. Berdeen, Verna growled as she caught Berdeen's arm. We don't have time for this. It is devotion. It is part of our bond to Lord Rao. You would be wise to go to devotion, and then maybe you will remember that. Verna stood frozen in the vast hall, stunned, watching the moored Sith stalk off. Verna had a vivid memory of the time that the bond to Richard had been severed. It hadn't been for long, but in Richard's absence from the world of life, the protection of the bond to the Lord Rall had ceased to exist. In that brief window in time, when Richard and the bond were gone from them all, Jagang had stolen into Verna's dreams to capture her mind. He had captured Warren as well. It had been beyond horror to have the Dreamwalker in control of her consciousness, but it had been all the worse to know that Warren was just as helpless. Jagang's brutal presence had dominated every aspect of their existence, from what they could think to what they had to do. They no longer had control of their own will. Jagang's will was all that mattered. Just the memory of the searing pain that had been sent through that link into her and into Warren unexpectedly brought the sting of tears to Verna's eyes. She quickly wiped away the tears and hurried after Berdine. Verna had important things to do, but she would lose untold time trying to find her way all alone in the vast interior of the people's palace. She needed the moored Sith to show her the way. If Verna had control of her gift, it might help her find what she sought, but in the palace her Han was virtually useless. She would just have to go along with Berdine and hope that they could then get back to business without the loss of too much time. The passageway to the left led under an interior bridge with a rail and balusters made of gray marble struck through with white veins. At a convergence of four passageways, the hall expanded into a square open to the sky. In the center of the square was a square pond with a short, polished, speckled gray granite seat all the way around that held the water within it. A large pitted rock sat in the water a little off center. Atop the rock sat the bell, apparently the one that had rung calling people to the devotion. Gentle rain had begun to fall in through the open roof. The surface of the pond danced with the drops. Verna saw that the floor all around the square was gently sloped toward drains in order to handle any rain. The clay tiles helped reinforce the realization that the square was really out of doors. All around, the people were going to their knees, bowing down on the clay tile floor, facing the pond that held the now silent bronze bell. Berdine's dark discontent evaporated at seeing that Verna was coming with her. She smiled back happily 
and then did the strangest thing. She reached out and took Verna's hand. Come on, let me take you up by the pond. It has fish. Fish? Verdine's grin widened. Yes, I love these squares with fish. Sure enough, after they wove their way through all the people kneeling down on the floor and reached the front of the crowd close to the pond, Verna saw that there were schools of orange fish meandering through the water. There was hardly enough room for them to stand among all the people bowed down on the floor around them. Aren't they pretty? Berdine asked. She had that little girl air about her again. Verna glared at the young woman. They're fish. Berdine seemed unfazed and knelt in a spot that opened up as people moved aside for them. Verna could see by the sidelong glances that everyone had at least a healthy respect for the moored Sith, if not open fear. While none of them appeared frightened enough to leave, they clearly didn't want to be where Berdine wanted to be when she wanted to be there. They also seemed more than a little worried about who the moored Sith was dragging to the devotion, as if it might be a repentant sinner and the lesson might involve bloodshed. Berdine glanced over her shoulder at Verna before leaning forward and placing her hands on the tile floor. The brief look had been an admonition for Verna to do the same. Verna saw that the guards were watching her. This was crazy. She was the prelate of the Sisters of the Light, an advisor to Richard and one of his close friends. But the guards didn't know that. Verna knew all too well that her power was diminished to next to nothing in the palace. This was the ancestral home of the House of Rahl. The entire palace had been built in the shape of a spell form designed to enhance their power and deny others theirs. Verna let out a sigh and finally went to her knees, bowing forward on her hands like everyone else. They were close to the pond, but the opening in the roof was only about the size of the pond itself, so the rain was confined mostly to the pond and whatever stray rain the gentle breeze carried beyond. The few sprinkles that reached her actually felt rather refreshing, considering her heated mood. I'm too old for this, Verna complained in a whisper to her devotion partner. Prelith, you are a young, healthy woman, Verdine chided. Verna let out a sigh. It was no use arguing the foolishness of kneeling on the floor and saying a devotion to a man she was already devoted to in more ways than one, but it was more than foolish, it was silly, and a waste of time besides. Master Rawl, guide us, the crowd all began together, if not all quite in harmony, as they bowed down and put their foreheads against the floor. Master Rawl, teach us, they all said, coming more into unison. Berdine, her forehead against the tile, still managed to cast a fiery look Verna's way. Verna rolled her eyes and bent forward, placing her forehead against the tile. Master Rawl, protect us, she muttered, finally joining in with the devotion she knew and had already once given to Richard himself. In your light we thrive, in your mercy we are sheltered, in your wisdom we are humbled, we live only to serve, our lives are yours. Verna sourly considered how, if Richard didn't wisely hurry up and get his hide to the Daharan army, he wasn't going to be able to protect anyone. Together the assembled throng softly chanted the devotion again. Master Rawl, guide us. Master Rawl, teach us. Master Rawl, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Verna leaned a little toward Berdine and whispered, How many times are we going to have to say the devotion? Berdine, looking very much the moored Sith, shot Verna a stern glare. She didn't say anything. She didn't have to. Verna recognized the look. She herself had countless times used the same look as she peered down her nose at novices who were misbehaving or young wizards in training who were being mulish. Verna turned her eyes back to the tile under her, feeling very much like a novice again, as she softly spoke the chant along with the rest of the people. Master Rawl, guide us. Master Rawl, teach us. Master Rawl, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. 
Our lives are yours. The murmur of the chanted devotion and the single joined voice of all the people gathered in the square echoed through the cavernous halls. After the look Berdeen had given her, Verna thought it best if, for the time being, she kept her objections to herself and said the devotion along with everyone else. She spoke the words softly, thinking about them, and how many times they had proven true for her personally. Richard had changed everything about her life. Verna had thought that the most important mission for the sisters was to put a collar around gifted boys' necks and train them in the use of their ability. Richard had humbled her for that unthinking belief. He had changed everything, made her rethink everything. If not for Richard, Verna doubted that she would ever have been thrown together with Warren and that their fondness for each other would have blossomed into love. In that, Richard had given her the greatest thing she had ever had in her life. Master Rao, guide us. Master Rao, teach us. Master Rao, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. The cadence of the murmured words of all the voices of the gathered people joined into a reverent sound that swelled until it filled the great hall. Verna felt so all alone even among the gathered crowd of so many people. She ached with how much she missed Warren. She had built a wall around her feelings and had shut herself away from such thoughts, as well as those around her, hoping to be spared the pain that always seemed to lurk just below the surface. Now she was suddenly overwhelmed by the raw misery of how much she missed Warren, how much she loved him, he was the best thing that had ever happened in her entire life, and now he was gone. Tears from her hopeless heartache welled up. She felt so alone. Master Rao, guide us. Master Rao, teach us. Master Rao, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Verna sucked back a sob as she remembered kissing Warren for the last time as he lay dying. That had been the most dreadful moment in her entire life. Despite the time that had passed, it had seemed as if it had happened yesterday. She missed him so much that it made her bones ache. Master Rao, guide us. Master Rao, teach us. Master Rao, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Verna spoke the words of the devotion along with everyone else, pouring her feelings into them over and over, yet without haste. The murmured chant filled her mind. She wept as she remembered the time she'd had with Warren. She remembered his last words to her. Give me a kiss, Warren had whispered while I still live. And don't mourn what ends, but what a good life we've had. Kiss me, my love. Pain and longing twisted her insides. Her world was ashes. Nothing seemed worthwhile. She didn't want to live anymore. Master Rao, guide us. Master Rao, teach us. Master Rao, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. Verna choked back her sobs as she chanted the devotion. It never even occurred to her to wonder if anyone noticed her. It had all been so senseless. A young man of no ability for anything worthwhile, with no interest in any values, of no use to anyone including himself, murdering Warren just to prove his loyalty to the cause of the imperial order, which was, in essence, that people like Warren had no right to live his own life, but instead should sacrifice themselves for the likes of his murderer. Richard fought to end such madness. Richard fought with everything he had against those who brought such senseless brutality to the world, Richard had given himself over to ending it, 
so that others would not have to lose those they loved as Verna had lost Warren. Richard truly understood her pain. Verna sank into the rhythm of the chant, allowing it to wash through her. Richard stood for everything she had fought for her whole life, solidity, meaning, purpose. A devotion to such a man, rather than being blasphemy, seemed altogether right, in a way because of who Richard was and what he stood for. It was actually a devotion to life itself rather than some otherworldly goal. Richard had been Warren's good friend, his first real friend. Richard had brought Warren up out of the vaults and into the sunlight, into the world. Warren loved Richard. The soft chant had become a calming refuge. Verna felt a warm shaft of sunlight settling on her as it broke through the clouds. She was bathed in the gentle golden glow of light. It embraced her with its warmth that seemed to seep down and touch her very soul. Warren would want her to embrace all the precious beauty of life while she had it. In the loving touch of glowing light, she felt peace for the first time in ages. Master Rao, guide us. Master Rao, teach us. Master Rao, protect us. In your light we thrive. In your mercy we are sheltered. In your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. The soft flow of the words of the devotion as she knelt in the warm shaft of sunlight filled her with a profound calm, a serene sense of belonging unlike she ever had before. She whispered the words, letting them lift away the shards of pain. As she knelt, her head to the tiles, putting her heart and soul into saying the words, she felt free of any and every worry. She was suffused with the simple joy of life and with reverence for it. As she chanted along with everyone else, she basked in the tender glow of the sunlight. It felt so warm so protective, so loving. It almost felt like Warren's loving embrace. As she chanted along with everyone else over and over without pause but for breath, time slipped by, incidental, inconspicuous, unimportant within the core of calm she felt. The bell rang out twice, a low, mellow, comforting affirmation that the devotion had ended but at the same time would always be there with her. Verna looked up when she felt a hand on her shoulder. It was Berdine smiling down at her. Verna looked around and saw that most of the people were already gone. She alone still bowed forward on her hands and knees on the floor before the pool. Berdine was kneeling beside her. Verna, are you all right? She straightened up on her knees. Yes. It's just that it felt so good in the sunlight. Berdine's brow twitched. She glanced over at the drops of rain dancing in the water of the pond. Verna, it has been raining the whole time. Verna peered around as she stood. But I felt it. I saw the glow of the shaft of light all around me. Berdine seemed to catch on then and put a comforting hand on the small of Verna's back. I understand. You do? Berdine nodded with a compassionate smile. Going to devotion in a way gives you a chance to consider your life, and along with that it brings comfort in many forms. Maybe one who loves you came to comfort you. Verna stared at the soft smile on the moored Sith's face. Has that ever happened to you? Berdine swallowed as she nodded. Her eyes brimming with tears said that it had. Chapter 31 They followed what seemed like a meandering, wandering, convoluted course through the people's palace, not because they were lost or because they were taking their time and picking random routes as they came upon intersections of hallways, but because there was no straight route. The complex, confusing passage through the labyrinth was necessary because the place had not been built to accommodate ease of travel through the palace, but rather it had been constructed in the explicit shape of a power spell that had been drawn on the face of the ground. 
Verna found it astonishing to consider that this was not only a spell form, similar to spells she herself had drawn, but that she was actually inside the elements that made up the spell. It was an entirely new perspective on conjuring, and one on an imposing scale. Since the power spell for the house of Rahl was still active, she knew that the configuration of the foundation would probably have had to have been first drawn in blood, Rahl blood. As the two of them walked down vast halls, Verna could not get over her astonishment at the utter beauty of the place, to say nothing of its size. She had seen grand places in the past, but the sheer magnitude of the people's palace was staggering. It was less a palace and more of a city in the desolate Azrith plains. The palace atop the immense plateau was only a part of the vast complex. The interior of the plateau was honeycombed with thousands of rooms and passageways, and there were innumerable stairs taking different routes up through the chambers inside. A great number of people sold goods and services in the lower reaches of the plateau. It was a long and tiring climb up endless flights of stairs to reach the elaborate palace at the top. So many of the visitors who came to trade or make purchases did their business in those lower reaches, never taking the time to make it up all the way to the palace proper at the top. Even more people did business at open-air markets around the base of the plateau. There was a single winding road interrupted by a drawbridge along the outside of the plateau. Even if it weren't heavily defended, it would still be virtually impossible to attack the palace by that road. The interior of the plateau offered many more ways up. There were even ramps used by horsemen, but there were thousands of troops guarding the inside passages, and if need be, there were colossal doors that could be closed sealing off the plateau and the palace within. Black stone statues standing to either side of a wide white marble hallway watched Verna and Berdine as they made their way down the long hall. Torchlight glimmered off the polished black marble of the towering sentinels, making them almost seem alive. The contrasting color of stone, the black statuary in a white marble hall, added a sense of foreboding to the passage. Most of the stairwells they ascended were quite large, some with polished marble balustrades more than an arm's length across. Verna found the variety of stone within the palace amazing. It seemed like each vast room, each passageway, each stairwell had its own unique combination of colors. A few of the more utilitarian or service areas that Berdine took them through were done in bland, beige limestone, while the more important public areas were composed of startlingly vivid colors in contrasting patterns that lent an uplifting sense of life and excitement to the space. Some of the private corridors that served as shortcuts for officials were paneled in highly polished woods illuminated by silver reflector lamps that added warm light. While some of those private corridors were relatively small, the main passageways stood several stories high. Some of the largest, main branches of the spell form, were lit from above by windows in the roof that let the light stream in. Rows of soaring columns to each side rose to the roof far above. Balconies between those fluted pillars looked down on the people passing below. In several places, there were walkways that crossed over Verna's head. In one spot, she saw two levels of walkways, one above the other. At times, they had to go up to some of these higher levels, cross bridges over the passageways, and then descend again into a different branch of hallways, only to once more have to go back up in another place. Despite the up and down of the serpentine route, they steadily worked their way higher into the center of the palace. Through here, Berdine said as she reached a pair of mahogany doors. The doors were twice as tall as Verna. Carved in the face of the thick mahogany were a pair of snakes, one on each door, their tails coiled around branches higher up with their bodies hanging down so that the heads were at eye level. Fangs jutted out from gaping jaws as if the pair were about to strike. 
The door handles, not much lower than the snake's heads, were bronze, mellowed with a patina that spoke of its age. The handles were life-sized, grinning skulls. Lovely, Verna muttered. They are a warning, Verdine said. This is meant to command people to stay out. Couldn't they just paint keep out on the door? Not everyone can read, Verdine lifted an eyebrow. Not everyone who can read will admit to it when caught opening the door. This gives them no excuse to cross the threshold innocently and lets them know that they will have no excuse when confronted by guards. From the chill that the sight of the doors gave her, Verna could imagine that most anyone would give them a wide berth. Berdine threw her weight into the effort of pulling open the heavy door on the right. Inside, a cozy carpeted room paneled in the same mahogany as the tall doors, but without any more of the carved snakes, four big soldiers stood guard. They looked more fearsome than the bronze skulls. The closest soldier casually stepped into their path. This area is restricted. Berdine, wearing a dark frown, skirted the man. Good, see to it that it stays that way. Remembering all too well that her power was next to useless in the palace, Verna stayed close on Berdine's heels. The soldier, apparently not eager to grab the moored Sith, instead blew a whistle that let out a thin, shrill sound, no doubt used because such a sound would carry up the stairs to other guards on patrol. The two farthest soldiers, however, stepped together to block the pathway through the room. One of the two held up a hand, if politely, commanding them to halt. I'm sorry, mistress, but as he said, and as you should well know, this is the restricted area. Berdine put one hand on a cocked hip. Her aegeals spun into her other fist. She gestured with it as she spoke. Since we both serve the same cause, I will not kill you where you stand. Be thankful that I'm not wearing red leather today, or I might take the time to teach you some manners. As you should be well aware, Mord Sith are personal bodyguards to the Lord Ral himself, and we are not restricted from anywhere we choose to go. The man nodded. I'm well aware of that, but I've not seen you around the palace for quite some time. I've been with Lord Ral. He cleared his throat. Be that as it may, since you've been gone, the Commander General has tightened security in this area. Good. As a matter of fact, I am here to see Commander General Trimac about that very subject. The man bowed his head. Very well, mistress, top of the stairs. Someone will be able to see to your wishes. When the two guards stepped apart, Berdine flashed an insincere smile and swept between them, Verna in tow. Crossing thick carpets of golds and blues, they came to a stairwell made of a rich, flushed, tawny marble webbed with rust-color veins. Verna had never seen stone quite like it. It was strikingly beautiful, with polished vase-shaped balusters and a wide handrail that was smooth and cool under her fingers. Changing direction at a broad landing, she spotted at the top of the stairs not just patrolling soldiers, but what appeared to be an entire army waiting for them. These were not going to be men Berdine would be able to so easily get past. What do you think all the soldiers are doing here? Verna asked. Up there and then down a hallway, Berdine answered in a low voice, is the Garden of Life. We've had trouble there in the past. That was the very reason Verna wanted to check on things. She could hear orders being passed and the sound of metal jangling as men came running. They were met at the top of the stairs by dozens of the guards, many with weapons drawn. Verna noticed that there were a lot more of the men wearing black gloves and carrying crossbows. This time, though, the crossbows were cocked and loaded with the red-fletched arrows. Who's in charge here? Berdine demanded of all the young faces staring at her. I am. A more mature man called out as he pushed his way through the tight ring of soldiers. He had piercing blue eyes, but it was the pale scars on his cheek and jaw that caught Verna's attention. Berdine's face brightened at seeing the man. General Tremac! 
Men made way for him as he stepped to the fore. He deliberately took in Verna before turning his attention to Berdeen. Verna thought she detected the slightest smile. Welcome back, Mistress Berdeen. I haven't seen you for quite a while. Seems like forever. It's good to be home. She lifted an introductory hand to Verna. This is Verna Sovintrin, the prelate of the Sisters of the Light. She is a personal friend of Lord Rall and in charge of the gifted with the Daharan forces. The man bowed his head, but kept his cautious gaze on her. Prelate? Verna, this is Commander General Trimak of the First File of the People's Palace in Dahara. First File? When he is at his palace, we are the ring of steel around Lord Rall himself, Prelate. We fall to a man before Harn gets a glance at him. His eyes shifted between the two of them. Because of the great distance, we can only sense that Lord Rall is somewhere far off to the west. Would you happen to know where Lord Rall is exactly? Any idea when he will be back with us? There are a number of people wanting to know the answer to that question, General Trimac, Verna said. I'm afraid that you will have to step to the rear of a very long line. The man looked genuinely disappointed. What of the war? Do you have any news? Verna nodded. The Imperial Order has split their forces. The soldiers glanced knowingly at one another. Trimac's face hardened with worry as he waited for her to elaborate. The order left a sizable part of their force on the other side of the mountains up near Aidendrill in the Midlands. We had to leave men and some of the gifted on this side of the mountains to guard the passes so the enemy can't come over and get into Dahara. A large contingent of the order's best troops are presently heading back down through the Midlands. We believe that their plan is to take their main force down around the far side of the mountains and then eventually swing around and up to attack Dahara from the south. We are taking our main army south to meet the enemy. None of the men said a word. They stood mute, showing no reaction to probably the most fateful news they had ever faced in their young lives. These were indeed men of steel. The general wiped a hand across his face as if all their concern was distilled into him alone. So our army coming south is close to the palace then? No, they are still some distance to the north. Armies don't move rapidly unless necessary. Since we don't have nearly as much distance to cover as the order, and Jagang moves his troops at a slow pace, we felt it would be better to keep our men healthy and strong, rather than exhaust them on a long race south. Berdine and I rode on ahead because it was urgent that I examine some of the books here on matters to do with magic. As long as I'm here, I thought I should check on things in the Garden of Life to make certain that everything is safe. The man took a breath as he drummed his fingers on his weapons belt. I'd like to help you, Prelate, but I have orders from three wizards to keep everyone out of there. They were quite specific. No one, not even the gardening staff, is to be allowed to go in there. Verna's brow tightened. What three wizards? First wizard Zorander, then Lord Rall himself, and lastly wizard Nathan Rall. Nathan. She might have known he would be trying to make himself look important at the palace, no doubt dramatically playing up the part of being a gifted Rall, an ancestor to Richard. Verna wondered what other trouble the man had been mucking about in while he was at the People's Palace. Commander General, I am a sister and prelate of the Sisters of the Light. I'm fighting on the same side as you. Sister, he said with an accusatorial squint-eyed glare that only an army officer could conjure up. We had a sister visit us before, a couple years back. Remember, lads? He glanced around at the grim faces before turning back to Verna. Wavy, shoulder-length brown hair about your size, prelate. She was missing the little finger on her right hand. Maybe you'll remember her, one of your sisters, I believe. Odette, Verna confirmed with a nod. Lord Raoul told me about the trouble you had with her. She was a fallen sister, you might say. 
I don't really care what side of the Creator's grace she was on the day she visited us. I only know that she killed almost 300 men getting into the Garden of Life. 300. She killed nearly a hundred more getting back out. We were helpless against her. As his face reddened, his scars stood out all the more. Do you know what it's like to see men dying and not be able to do a bloody thing about it? Do you know what it's like not only to be responsible for their lives, but to know that your duty is to keep her out of there and not be able to do anything to stop the threat? Verna's gaze fell away from the man's intent blue eyes. I'm sorry, General, but she was fighting against Lord Rowell. I am not. I'm on your side. I'm fighting to stop those like her. That may be true enough, but my orders from both Zed and Lord Rahl himself, after he killed that vile woman, are that no one else is to be allowed in there. No one. If you were my own mother, I'd not be able to let you go in there. Something didn't make sense to her. Verna cocked her head. If Sister Odette was able to get in there, and you and your men couldn't stop her, she lifted an eyebrow. Then what makes you think you can stop me? I'd not like it to come to that, but if need be, this time we have the means at hand to carry out our orders. We are no longer helpless. Verna frowned. What are you talking about? Commander General Trimac plucked a black glove from his belt and pulled it on, flexing his fingers to draw the snug glove all the way onto his hand. With a thumb and first finger of his gloved hand, he carefully lifted a red-fletched arrow from the rack of six in a quiver at the belt of a soldier beside him. The soldier already had one of the bolts knocked in his crossbow, leaving four in the special quiver rack. Holding the bolt by the knock end, General Trimac lifted the razor-sharp steel point before Verna's face so that she could see it up close. This is tipped with more than steel. It's tipped with the power to take down those with magic. I still don't know what you are talking about. It's tipped with magic that is said to be able to penetrate any shield the gifted can erect. Verna reached out and with a finger carefully touched the rear of the shaft. Pain shot up her hand and wrist before she was able to jerk her arm back. Despite her gift being diminished in the palace, she had no trouble being able to detect the powerful aura given off by the web of magic that had been spun around the deadly point. This was indeed a potent weapon. Even with their full powers, the gifted would indeed be in trouble if they encountered one of these arrows coming toward them. If you have these arrows, then why weren't you able to stop Sister Odette? We didn't have them back then. Verna's frown darkened. Then where did you get them? The general smiled with the satisfaction of a man who knew he would not again be defenseless against a gifted enemy. When Wizard Rall was here, he asked me about our defenses. I told him about the attack by the sorceress and how we were helpless against his power. He searched the palace and found these weapons. Apparently, they were in some safe place where only a wizard could retrieve them. He is the one who supplied my men with the arrows and the crossbows to fire them. How good of Wizard Rao. Yes, it was. The general carefully replaced the bolt in the special quiver rack that kept the arrow separated. She understood now why that was necessary. There was no telling how ancient these weapons really were, but Verna suspected that they were relics from the Great War. Wizard Rall instructed us on how to handle such dangerous weapons. He held up his hand and wiggled his gloved fingers, told us that we must always wear these special gloves to handle the arrows. He removed the glove and tucked it behind his belt with its mate. Verna clasped her hands before herself, taking a deep breath and with it care in how she framed her words. General, I have known Nathan Rawl since long before your grandmother was born. He is not always candid about the dangers involved in the things he does. Were I you, I would handle those weapons with the utmost care and treat anything he told you about them, even casually, 
as a matter of life and death. Are you suggesting he's reckless? No, not deliberately. But he often tends to downplay matters that he finds inconvenient. Besides that, he is very old and very talented. So sometimes it's easy for him to forget just how much more he knows about some very arcane subjects than most other people or that he can do things with his gift that they aren't able to do, much less comprehend. You might say he's like an old man who forgets to tell visitors that his dog bites. Men up and down the hall exchanged looks. Some of them lifted an elbow or a hand away from the quivers at their belts. General Trimac hooked a thumb around the hilt of the short sword in its sheath at his left hip. While I take seriously your warning, prelate, I hope that you will understand that I also take seriously the lives of the hundreds of my men who died the last time a sister showed up and we were defenseless against her magic. I take seriously the lives of these men here. I don't want any such thing to happen again. Verna wet her lips and reminded herself that the man was only doing his job. With the way the palace drained away her Han, she had an uncomfortable empathy with his feeling about being powerless. I understand, General Trimac. She smoothed back a wave of hair. I too know the heavy weight of responsibility for the lives of others. Of course the lives of your men are valuable, and anything that will prevent the enemy from taking those lives is worthwhile. It is in that vein that I'm advising you to be careful with weapons that are wrought with magic. Such things are not typically intended for the unsupervised use of the ungifted. The man nodded once. We take your warning seriously. Good. Then you should also know that what is in that room is dangerous in the extreme. It's a danger to all of us. It would be in all our interest if, while I'm here, I just make sure it's safe. Prelate, I understand your concern but you must understand that my orders gave me no discretion for exceptions. I simply can't allow you to go in there on your word that you are who you say you are, or that your intent is only to help us. What if you were a spy, a traitor, the keeper himself in the flesh? A sincere-looking woman though you may be, I didn't get to the rank of commander general by letting attractive women talk me into things. Verna was momentarily startled by being called an attractive woman in front of all these people. But I can personally assure you that no one, no one at all, has been in there since Lord Rall himself was in there last. Not even Nathan Rall went in there. Everything in the Garden of Life remains untouched. I understand, General. It would be a long time before she ever made it back to the palace. There was no telling where Richard was or when he would return. She rubbed her fingers on her forehead as she considered the quandary. Tell you what, how about if I don't go in, and instead I just stand in the doorway outside the Garden of Life and look in to make sure the three boxes being held in there are safe. You can even have a dozen of your men point those deadly arrows at my back. He chewed his lip as he considered. Men in front of you, men to the sides and men to the back, will have you under the points of their arrows and their fingers will be on the release levers. You can look past my men through the doorway and into the Garden of Life, but you may not cross the threshold under penalty of death. Verna didn't actually need to get close enough to touch the boxes. Truth be told, she didn't really even want to get close to them. All she really wanted to do was to make sure that they were untouched by anyone else. At the same time, she wasn't exactly comfortable with the idea of all those men being only a finger twitch away from releasing one of those deadly arrows at her. After all, the notion to check on the boxes of Orden had only been an afterthought, being as she was already at the palace. It wasn't why she had come to the palace. Still, she was so close. Bargain struck, General. I only need to see that they are safe, so that we all can sleep a little easier. I'm all for sleeping easier. Verdine and Verna, 
with a knot of soldiers surrounding them, were led by Commander General Trimac down a broad passageway of polished granite. Columns spaced against the wall framed great slabs of stone as if they were artwork. To Verna, they were visual evidence of the Creator's hand, artwork from the garden he had cultivated that was the world of life. The sound of all the men moving along with them echoed up and down the great hallway as they passed a series of intersections that were arms of the spell form all pulling back into the center that was the garden of life. They at last came to a pair of doors covered in carvings of rolling hills and forests and sheathed in gold. Beyond is the garden of life, the general told her in a sober tone. As soldiers surrounded her, raising their crossbows, the general began drawing one of the great gold doors open. Some of the men to the side and rear pointed their arrows at her head. The four men who moved in front of her leveled their crossbow bolts at her heart. She was at least relieved not to have the ones in front of her pointed at her face. She thought the whole thing was silly, but she knew that these men were dead serious, so she treated it as such. As the gold-clad door was swung wide, Verna, in lockstep with her cadre of personal assassins, shuffled closer to the opening so that she could see. She had to crane her neck and finally swish a hand to gently urge one of the men to move a little to the side so that she could have a clear view into the great room. From the rather dimly lit hallway, Verna peered inside and saw that overcast skies lit the place in all its glory through leaded windows high overhead. She was astonished to see that all the way up in the center of the people's palace, the garden of life looked just like a lush garden. From what she could see, around the outside of the room, walkways wound their way through flower beds. The ground was littered with petals, a few still colorful reds and yellows, but most long since dried and shriveled. Beyond the flowers grew small trees, and then beyond them were short stone vine-covered walls. Contained within the walls was a variety of shrubs and ornamental plants, although they were in sorry shape from lack of care. Many were gangly with long new shoots and in need of trimming. Others were infested with invasive vines. It looked as if General Trimac had been telling the truth that no one, not even the gardeners, had been allowed into the place. At the Palace of the Prophets, they had had an indoor garden, although on a much smaller scale. There had been a system of pipes coming from collection barrels on the roof that kept the garden watered. Recognizing similar pipes in a corner, Verna realized that rainwater collected on the roof provided a constant supply of water in this place as well, or everything in the garden, lit by such wonderful light, would be dried up and dead. In the center of the expansive room was an area of shaggy lawn that swept around almost into a circle, the grass ring interrupted by a wedge of white stone. On that stone sat two short, fluted pedestals that held a slab of smooth granite. Atop the granite altar sat three boxes, their surfaces such an inky black that it almost surprised her that they didn't suck the light entirely out of the room and pull the whole world with it into the eternal darkness of the underworld. Just the sight of such sinister things made her heart feel as if it were coming up in her throat. Verna knew the three boxes in the gateway, and they were exactly what the name implied. In this case, they were together a kind of gateway between the world of the living and the world of the dead. The gateway was constructed of the magic of both worlds. If that passage between worlds were ever to be undone, the veil would be breached and the seal would be off the nameless one, the keeper of the dead. Because the information had been in highly restricted books, only a few people at the Palace of the Prophets were even aware of the gateway by its ancient name, the Boxes of Orden. The three boxes worked together, and together they constituted the gateway. 
As far as anyone at the Palace of the Prophets knew, the gateway had been lost for over 3,000 years. Everyone thought that it was gone, vanished, disappeared for good. There had even been speculation for centuries as to whether or not such a gateway had ever really existed. If such a gateway could even exist had been the source of much heated theological debate. The gateway, the boxes of Orden, did exist, and Verna was having trouble taking her eyes off it. It made her heart race to see such vile things. Cold sweat dampened her dress. It was small wonder that three wizards had ordered the general to allow no one into the room. Verna reconsidered her opinion of Nathan for equipping the first file with such dangerous weapons. The jeweled covering had been removed, leaving the sinister black of the boxes themselves, because Dark and Rawl had put the boxes in play and had planned to use the power of Orden to claim mastery over the world of the living. Fortunately, Richard had stopped him. Stealing the boxes now, though, wouldn't do a thief any good. Extensive information was required to understand how the magic of Orden worked and how the gateway functioned. Part of that information was contained in a book that no longer existed except in Richard's mind. That, in fact, had been part of how he had defeated Dark and Rawl. In addition to vast knowledge and information, any thief would also need to have both additive and subtractive magic in order to use the gateway or to claim the power of Orden for himself. The real danger would probably be to any person foolish enough to handle such treacherous things. Verna sighed with relief at seeing the three boxes untouched right where Richard had said he'd left them. For now there was no safer place to keep such dangerous magic. Someday, maybe Verna could help find a way to destroy the gateway, if such a thing were even possible. But for now, it was safe. Thank you, General Tremac. I'm relieved to see that everything is as it should be. And it will stay that way, he said, as he put his weight against the door. It soundlessly moved closed. No one is getting in there except Lord Rall. Verna smiled at the man. Good. She glanced around at the magnificent palace around her, the illusion of permanence, peace, and security it exuded. If only it were so. Well, I'm afraid that we need to be on our way. I have to get back to our forces. I will tell General Meifert that things here at the palace are well in hand. Let us hope that Lord Raoul will be joining us soon, and we can stop the Imperial Order before they ever reach this place. Prophecy says that if he joins us for the final battle, we have a chance to crush the Imperial Order, if not drive them back to the Old World. The General gave her a grim nod. May the good spirits be with you, Prelate. With Berdine at her side, Verna made her way back out of the restricted area and away from the Garden of Life. As they once again descended the stairs, she was relieved to be on her way back to the army, even if she was worried over their mission. She realized that since coming to the palace, she felt more of a sense of commitment and more of a sense of connection to what had become the Daharan Empire under Richard. Even more than that, she seemed to care more about life. But if they didn't find Richard and get him to lead their forces in the battle they would face when they finally met the Imperial Order, then the mission to stop Jagang's army was suicide. <laughs>